Can you show me that the, there we go. That says that the, we're on air. No, we're not on air until you are, but we got to, we, that means we're on camera. Recording in progress. Okay, we are live now. Okay, thank you. I'd like to call to order the monthly, bi-monthly meeting of the Planning and Transportation Commission for June 29th, 2022. And if we could have the roll, please. Yeah. Chair Lowey. Present. Commissioner Heckman. Present. Commissioner Regdal. Present. Commissioner Templeton. Present. Commissioner Rupervar. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Three in chambers and two by Zoom. So almost a perfect hybrid. <clears throat> okay. Um, are there any from the public? Are there any oral communications on an item that is not currently on tonight's agenda? We have one raised hand, but let me just quickly remind people how, how they can provide public comments online or if they're in the council chambers. Right now, we do not have anyone in council chambers, so I'll just quickly remind people how they can provide public comments online. Great, thank you. Yeah. Pursuant to AB 361, this meeting will be held with the option to attend by teleconference or in person. Spoken comments via computer or a smartphone will be accepted through the Zoom app. To address the commission, go to zoom.us slash join. Meeting ID is 916-4155-9499. When you wish to speak, click on raised hand. To offer comments using a regular phone, call 669-900-6833 and enter meeting ID 916-4155-9499. When you wish to speak on agenda item, hit star 9 on your phone so you know that, um, so that we know you wish to speak. That's it. Thank you. Okay. And do we have any comments for oral communications? Yeah, we have one uh, raised hand, and it is Aram James. Okay, we have the timer up, please. Yes, yes. Great, thank you. Mr. James, go ahead. Okay, I'm looking for the, uh, the, the clock to start. Can you can you hear me, Mr. Ladding? Yes, it, uh, it started. The clock started. Good. So... You know, you ran for city council once, and I'm glad to see you running again. Uh, but last time I tried to reach you multiple times to talk uh, about your ideas for the city. And uh, for whatever reason, we weren't able to communicate. So I'm going to give you my phone number. It's 415-370-5056. I'd like to, to talk to you about a variety of issues, but certainly um, police practices issues in the city of Palo Alto and uh, trying to uh, make certain that Palo Alto has the best police practices in the state that they don't engage in uh, as they have historically on routine racial profiling, brutalizing uh, people of color, uh, releasing canines on-, on oh, Okay, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you, but um, is uh, this well, relative to this planning? What's that now? Is, is this relative to planning? I'm just uh, in the well, well, this this is oral communication, and, and and I can talk on any subject other than what's on the agenda. So that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, I will be talking on the on the housing issue, but that's not appropriate during this oral communication, as you know. Right. Can I, can I proceed? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm right now. I'm trying to get Ed Chicada to bring the three finalists in for police chief, so that we, the citizens, can interview them and see what. What, what they, may, they might look like in terms of their leadership as a new chief. He's been resistant to that. There's precedent in 2009 where former city manager James King uh, announced the name of the three finalists. So we, the citizens, could put some pressure on them so we could do our own investigation about those officers and their background. So I'm, I'm asking that everybody out there in the public call Mr. Shikata, the city manager of Palo Alto, and Tell him we'd like 
post George Floyd to have transparency in reference to who our next police chief is going to be. And uh, <clears throat> he, I, the last line of a, of a, a, a op-ed I wrote back on in the, that was published in the Daily Post back on June 6, 2022 reads as follows. Two years after the police execution of George Floyd and Mr. Shikata, you still haven't received the memo. The public doesn't trust their police and demands transparency in all matters related to police practices, including the hiring of our name being fired right now. What I'm interested in him doing is bringing the three police finalists into Palo Alto so the council can interview them, I can interview them, and people that have been victimized by the police can do that and see how, who's going to be the best leader. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Are there, are there any other speakers? Okay. That concludes oral communications. Thank Great. you. Great, thank you. Okay, are there any agenda changes, additions, or deletions for tonight? Nothing from staff. Okay, director's report would be next item. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Jonathan Late, Director for Planning and Development Services. Just a few items to report. Uh, last, uh, there's been a, a few council meetings since the Planning uh, and Transportation Commission's last meeting, most notably was last week. There were a couple of items. One is you should know the city council approved the uh, operating budget uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. And uh, there was a uh, project that this commission reviewed uh, on Bayshore, the uh, state density bonus project that was approved 7-0 by the city council. And then um, they also approved a, uh, an urgency, an emergency ordinance uh, to establish a um, regulatory uh, framework to require a conditional use permit for firearms dealerships in Palo Alto. And uh, that's a, um, an ordinance that will be coming back to uh, the city council probably in August, but also to the Planning and Transportation Commission uh, maybe in September uh, to codify those changes uh, to make that a permanent uh, change to our ordinance. Um, other than that, that concludes the report. Okay, I see the representative from the Transportation Department, uh, Mr. Rios, has got a report as well. Thank you, Chair and, and Commissioners. It's Rafael Rios, um, Senior Engineer from the Office of Transportation. Um, I just wanted to give a brief update on a couple of things happening. Um, the Office of Transportation, we recently hired an administrative assistant and now fully staffed with 15 full-time employees. Um, an update on the Churchill Enhanced Bikeway Project. Um, also the, known as the, the bike path that's gonna connect to El Camino Real and Stanford. Um, the school, PAUSD school district um, last, er, sorry, earlier this month um, signed, signed the uh, memorandum of understanding and will now allow us to proceed with the final design and hopefully um, that project can go out to bid um, later this year. And lastly, um, I wanna talk about a, a, an event that we held yesterday, um, the city safe routes the school staff partnered with the PA USD special education staff in the Bay Area Outreach and Recognition Program from Berkeley to bring an adaptive cycling event for um, for exceptional needs summer school students at Pali High School. Um, all the special ed education secondary and post secondary extended school year students were invited. A similar event was held last year for elementary school students. In total. About 13 middle school students, six high school students, and three post-secondary students attended this year's event. Each student was fitted with adaptive bikes that were customized for youth with various physical abilities and needs. And these were, and the event was held at the Pali High School basketball courts. Um, the event was supported by four former and current student volunteers and partnering staff. Um, and adaptive cycling is one way the Safe Routes to School team incorporates equity for all students into its programs and and that's it and i'll happy to discuss any other things okay do commissioners have any questions for either the staff representatives i don't see any hands okay thanks to both of you 
<clears throat> uh, we'll move on to our uh, action item, which will consume the evening, which is a recommending recommendation to city council on 2331 housing element draft goals, policies, programming, programs, and implementing objectives. Um, so I think we're gonna be calling a couple of audibles here. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting a at place memo uh, that came out electronically uh, only about an hour and a half before the meeting, which is a supplement because staff is working on this constantly um, seven days a week. So, okay. Okay, so as you see, we're getting copies and those of us that are here and commissioners were given uh, it electronically, as I say, about an hour and a half uh, before the meeting. Um, so I think we'll go ahead with the staff report and uh, Mr. Lake can outline sort of the, the planned uh, process here, uh, including some new information from HCD and um, a new draft of the, the HIP stuff. So, yep. um, why don't you go ahead? Sounds good. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so just a, maybe just a brief uh, sort of update. And um, I think you've got one or two speakers uh, that want to speak to the item. So we'll make a, a brief sort of update presentation. And, uh, and then we have, um, uh, we could walk through the changes, um, you know, just to put it on the screen and we can walk through that as the, as the commission deliberates. Uh, so I, I think just a couple of things to note. One is that uh, since the Planning and Transportation Commission first uh, had its uh, initial public hearing uh, on the item, uh, we've had an opportunity to, well, first of all, you made great progress when you, when you considered this. We skipped a couple of programs and I think we left off on program four. Um, at that last meeting. And so since then, uh, staff has worked with the Planning and Transportation Commission uh, ad hoc committee uh, to review the rest of those programs um, and uh, deliberate on some of the uh, uh, more, you know, uh, sort of substantive uh, programs that are included uh, in that packet. In addition to meeting with the PTC ad hoc twice, we also met with the city council ad hoc once last week. And um, uh, between those uh, three ad hoc meetings and a, a meeting that staff had with the housing and community development uh, staff uh, earlier this week, uh, we've really learned, um, you know, we're able to make uh, a number of changes to the programs. And as we foreshadowed with our, uh, or forewarned maybe with our, um, uh, our planning commission packet last week, we did note that there were going to be, uh, we anticipated some changes. And so I apologize that uh, we were just able to get it to get that to you uh, today. Uh, I think we are still working on getting the paper copies down. Yeah. And, and so for members of the public, we can uh, have that. And then also for the commissioners, we'll have copies for you as well. Um, our thought is that uh, we, you know, as a process point, we might want to start with the um, goals, policies, and programs that were submitted to the Planning and Transportation Commission last week as a part of your regular packet. That includes some minor strikeout and underlying additions since the Planning Commission's last review. Uh, and then after we get through that, we can turn to the at places memo uh, and use that as a, uh, and walk through that um, document to review the uh, additional changes since then. Um, I, I think we, as we noted in the at places memo, there are some substantive changes related to the housing incentive program, which we're happy to dive into more deeply as the commission deliberates further on this. And then we had some, uh, some feedback from the city council ad hoc related to the ROLM and GM. Uh, zoning districts near the, um, I don't know if, what we call that. I, I, th I think we've depicted it as the Northeast part of town. Maybe it's just more East. I don't know. Um, geographically, the city's a little skewed in that regard. So um, anyways, near the freeway uh, and uh, we, can, we can walk through those changes as well. So uh, I think that concludes the, the staff presentation. We're prepared to walk through those changes uh, perhaps after you have uh, an opportunity to hear from the public.
Okay, and I'm presuming, but I want to ask the question of the two uh, PTC ad hoc members that are present tonight. Uh, if you guys wanted to give sort of an overall uh, presentation on substantive uh, recent work since the last meeting, or you just want to work that into the comments. Um, so that's. Uh, I'd like to see staff do that presentation. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Staff should do that presentation, Chair. Okay. Yeah, I think if they walk through it, then at the end we can add any comments Great. that anything was missed. Great. I just want to ask instead of do that. So. Okay, so let's go to public comment. Yep. Sounds good. We have uh, one uh, person in the chambers here, um, J Jeff Levinsky. Welcome. All right. Good evening, commissioners and staff. I appreciate all the thought from the community that's gone into these policies. I do think we need to keep in mind that when we upzone, we rarely end up with what we hoped. So let's be sure not to give away the ship. The massive upzoning in program 1.6 for Stanford seems very wrongheaded. It may be what Stanford's land development people and the office developers they work with want, but they do not speak for Stanford students, staff, faculty, and donors. Stanford has many thousands of employees. Stay very close to the microphone. Okay. Stanford has many thousands of employees, graduate students, living in apartments, postdocs, and others who qualify for low-income housing. Stanford also has an endowment of about $38 billion. It can afford to build 100% below market rate housing and fill it with its own needy students and staff many times over. Any upzoning for Stanford that's not 100% affordable housing is a terrible waste of precious land. It will add to global climate change by creating longer commutes, and it will effectively tax students and low-income staff in the Stanford community by forcing them to pay higher rents instead of having Stanford contribute its fair share. For a liberal town like Palo Alto, to treat people devoted to higher learning this way is wrong. We are becoming spineless, bending over to whatever developers say instead of requiring them to provide the affordable housing necessitated by their projects. And once we upzone for anything but 100% affordable housing, we will never be able to undo it. Program 1.6 for Stanford will make things worse, not better. Program 1.6 has other flaws. We don't need to allow housing taller than 50 feet. Developers love to get even more giveaways by claiming our current standards don't pencil out, but we have projects in town building 100% affordable housing in under, feet, under 50 feet, so clearly it can. We need to start saying yes, yes, yes to housing and no, no, no to offices. Let's apply that to other upzoning in Palo Alto. When we rezone to allow housing on commercial sites, let's not allow them to add or retain office space there. And on sites currently allowing office and housing, let's adjust the mix to be mostly housing and very little office. Finally, unparked retail is a disservice to the community and potential retailers. I found four separate places in the proposal that would allow 1,500 square feet of unparked retail. It's a terrible idea. It's anti-housing because it gives retail a big parking exemption regardless of how much housing is built. We already allow retail parking to double as residential parking when appropriate. Now that's pro-housing. Why undercut that existing policy? And when you exempt 1,500 square feet of retail from parking, the savings don't go to retailers, but rather into the pocket of the landowners. Landowners get enough from our city. Let's instead focus on the needs of those who live, work, and shop in our community. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Next up is uh, Hamilton Hitchings. We can reset the clock. There we go. Yep. Okay, great. Go ahead. Welcome. Mr. Hitchings, we should be able to hear you now. Thank Good you. evening, Commissioners and Jonathan. Although I was a member of the Housing Element Working Group, below are my personal additional suggestions. And I'm not going to, can you hear me? Yes. And I'm not going to refer to the specific programs, but they're in an email I sent you. Uh, we should limit Stanford El Camino sites to 50 feet. And for the additional proposed upzoning beyond that, 
require additional affordable housing of 20 or ideally 25% overall. Many of Stanford's staff need affordable housing to live in Palo Alto. For the, stands, for the transit center, Stanford Transit Center, uh, please add explicit language that states all or at least a majority of the housing be affordable housing. Uh, let's also put some teeth into the Stanford building a housing pipeline for the next cycle, such as being required to provide a certain percentage of the overall arena number, such as 20% for Palo Alto. Uh, probably the most important suggestion for actually building housing in Palo Alto, uh, which Jeff Wazinski referred to earlier, was add a program to rezone all housing sites on the Arena housing site list, which is about over 6,000 units, so they can only build housing and ground floor retail when required, when they redevelop, but no office. This is probably the most important suggestion. Uh, we also want to strengthen the language to ensure that rezoning sites that allow both housing and office on the same site uh, do it in such a way so it's more fiscally advantageous to build housing instead of office. Uh, for mixed use development, uh, it proposes to reduce the retail requirement to 1,500 in retail preservation zones, and this should be removed. It's partly unnecessary because the ground floor retail can already reduce the retail for parking ramps to underground, parking ramps to underground garages, and we really need the parking requirements. Also for mixed use development, um, it proposes far and height additions, but it's unnecessary because SB 330 already allows density and height bonuses that can be claimed for 15% inclusionary. Thus, this program should be removed. Also, we want to add a menu of pre-approved bonuses for SB 330, so they just can't claim any bonus. There's specific ones in line, and I don't know if we actually did that. Uh, for the HIP, we should really narrowly limit it to Rome GM and high density office. Uh, I believe we should also add a policy that would only exempt affordable housing impact fees for 80% of AMI and below since 120% AMI is almost market rate and we still need things like parks and infrastructure. Uh, lastly, let's add a policy that any site built higher than 50 feet must devote uh, additional space to deed restricted affordable housing in addition to the existing requirements for 15% affordable housing units. Uh, thank you very much for allowing my comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is Winter. Welcome. Hi, Winter Dellenbach. Um, the 27 University property is now home to MacArthur Park Res Restaurant. Um, and uh, is the, uh, that restaurant, Macar the, where MacArthur Park is, is the building, uh, is the building was designed by the first licensed female architect in California, Julia Morgan, uh, who is considered to be one of the five most renowned and influential women architects of the 20th century, and the first to be awarded by the American Institute of Architects its gold medal. Uh, it, it would be hard to overstate uh, Julia Morgan's importance in architecture in America and certainly California. Uh, that building's original purpose was as, as hostess house at Camp Fremont during World War I in Menlo Park. It was in Menlo Park for about two years before it was moved to Palo Alto in 1919 at its present site. It is listed on the National Register of Historic Buildings. National Register of Historic Buildings. It's an incredibly important building. Um, it is suggested that this historic Julia Morgan building be moved as if, as if having been moved over 100 years ago from Menlo Park, where it was only there for two years, justified yet another move. Um, nothing can justify another move. One of the um, standards uh, for uh, historic buildings is to not move them uh, around. Uh, unless they're going to be uh, completely demolished. Nothing justifies it. Nothing justifies Palo Alto casting aside its treasures, 
so carelessly. Once before, moving this Julia Morgan building was suggested a number of years ago, and no appropriate place was found then, and no appropriate place is going to be found now. But at a higher level, it simply flies in the face of any current standards by historic preservationists, is culturally backward, and frankly is embarrassingly ignorant. Should our city do such a thing, architects, preservationists, educated people all over California and nationally will be appalled at Palo Alto's desecration. Please ensure that this Julia Morgan historic building on its current site stays exactly where it is. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Arthur Keller. Re reset the clock. Yep. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, the first thing is policy 1.4 is kind of worded very strangely. It should read, ensure the retention, retention or replacement in kind by income level or lower of, of existing units that are redeveloped or demolished. Program 1.6F, we should, we should ensure that if the historic uh, Julia Morgan his Osis house is re retained or relocated to accessible or, or accessible or and viable site, we ensure before it's moved, we, after all, ensure the re re redevelopment does not involve demolishing or moving in train station buildings. After all, where is the historic Apex sign now? Uh, policy 4.1, we should exempt permanently affordable rental housing under 80% to 80% and AMI and permanently affordable for sale housing units for any infrastructure fees adopted by the city. Uh, we should, th these are permanently affordable housing units, but rental housing units should be under uh, only and under 80% AMI. Uh, and policy 3.4. Uh, rezone all sites in the housing inventory list to prohibit office use upon redevelopment. Allow only housing, retail, and in the case of 27 university and environments, transit uses on, the, on these sites. And policy 2.5, any site built higher than 50 feet must devote all additional space to indeed restricted affordable housing in addition to existing requirements for 15 or 20% affordable housing units. And that means it also is the form of fixes implemented, which is 1.2.6 and policy 2.6, extend the requirement for deed restricted affordable housing to apply to rental housing as well for sale housing. These, these rules should be implemented because they, they are, they, um, they uh, are, are policies that we should have going on. I agree with the uh, previous two speakers' comments, and thank you very much for my, your, your time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is, and last speaker is Terry Holzimmer. Okay. Clock set. Go ahead, Mr. Holzmer. Maybe we can come back to Mr. Holzimmer. Yep, not hearing anything. We do have another uh, hand up now. Yes, right. We just got another raised hand and it's from um, Jessica Von Bork, Jessica Van Bork, sorry. Yep, let's do that. Hello, good evening. Um, this is Jessica Van Bork with Stanford University, and I was a member of the working group as well, and uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak this evening. I'd first off like to start by saying we are very interested in building housing. Um, we support um, being part of the solution and have enjoyed our time on the working group. We'd also like to say that we appreciate the Planning Commission's consideration of taking a mo more holistic review of Stanford's sites along El Camino Real, and we continue to encourage the Planning Commission to not stipulate affordable percentages for sites at this current time. We'd also like to share that height isn't a trade-off for developing more affordable units. Height doesn't mean construction is more affordable, it simply means a project is feasible to build because it avoids underground parking. That's our statement for this evening. Thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you. Do we have Mr. Holtz we're back or no? Uh, I don't see him right now. Yeah, I don't either. Hello. Oh, there he is. There he is. Um, there yeah, he is. we can hear you now. Just a second. Let me quickly set up the timer, Mr. Holzimmer. Okay, thank you. There we go. Go ahead. Okay, very quickly. I just want to speak to you tonight about the housing element plan in the hopes that any new plan truly focuses on those who need the housing the most, especially those at 60 and 80% AMI level in our city. All of the new housing developments that request a rezoning or an upzoning should include a very significant increase of these types of units of 60 and 80% AMI well above what is accepted today at 15%. Please push to ensure that all arena sites are focused on housing and not just more office development. We have enough offices now, we don't need any more. I also encourage you to push back at Stanford and do more to make sure that they're doing their fair share to increase their housing, especially in the business park area, where there is land to build affordable housing, not only for its employees, but for our community. And finally, I'm very concerned about goal number three, which seems to focus more on market rate housing. I think we have enough of that. And we already meet many of those goals in ARENA. I think it's time to focus on the lower end and do what we can to build more affordable housing that is truly affordable for those that need it the most in our community. Thank you. Chair Lowing, I just see one more raised hand um, and it's just, it is from Adam James. Yes, that's fine. Let's reset the timer. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. There we go. Much. Go ahead. Thank you very much for letting me speak on this critical issue. Um, my expertise is more uh, criminal law and, and policing, but I have worked on issues like stopping the ban when uh, the city council didn't want to allow vehicles, uh, vehicle dwellers in town. Um, I also want to draw your attention to the June 1st release of the uh, the uh, initial reparations report uh, issued by uh, the uh, Secretary of State or Attorney General, I think it's Attorney General, but it, 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 it's a very, very long and extensive report. Um, they're going to have a, an, an additional or final report in the next year, but it's on reparations. And I strongly believe that at least 20% of the housing in Palo Alto needs to be set aside for African Americans. In order to fully understand the need for reparation, one needs to read the, the, the full report or there's an executive report, uh, executive summary of about five or 600 pages. I've been pushing the city of Palo Alto for the last three or four years to have their own commission on reparations and with, with, a, with a specific uh, goal of housing uh, and that, that reparations and housing be set aside because of all of the redlining and the, the efforts to keep black people out of the city of Palo Alto for hundreds of years. Now it's an opportunity to do the right thing. And this commission was uh, put together initially by Shirley Weber. Shirley Weber is now our secretary of state, the first black woman to hold that position. Um, she pushed while she was in, uh, in, in the state assembly and, uh, for this commission. And it's been in, in the works for more than a year now. And you will see, yes, we did have enslaved people in California. And we all know about the redlining and the reluctance to, to rent to black and brown people in Palo Alto. And if we're, if we're serious about making certain that Palo Alto is an equitable place and has a reputation across the country for that, then we have to talk seriously about reparations as part of any housing plan, any housing element in Palo Alto going forward. Uh, Ed, you're gonna be running for city council. I'm gonna be pushing you on that issue during the campaign. So far, 
I have not been able to get members of the city council with rare exception to even say the word reparations. There's just a lot of fear around that. It's almost like the, you know, in other states where people don't want to talk about critical race theory. We got to have the conversation. Doesn't mean you have to agree from the outset that we need to set aside large amounts of low-income housing in perpetuity for African-Americans, but let's at least have the conversation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for watching the clock. Uh, I think that is it. Yeah, I don't see any raised hands and I don't have any speaker cards. Okay. Yep. Um, let's come back to the commission then and see if there's first any general comments for staff or the housing element before we go sort of page by page? Uh, no, we don't have any additional uh, comments. Sir? And again, no, no additional comments from staff. And then uh, again, just a recommendation that we start with the um, attachment A that was included in your packet um, last week. Yeah, I just wanna see if commissioners have any general questions. Commissioner Heckman. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, staff, for uh, the continuing evolution of this. We do understand the time constraints, and um, uh, and and you know, I know from being on this commission two and a half years that that um, our staff strives to get us information as soon as it possibly can. But this is a a rapidly changing landscape, so uh, I think it's better to get it to us. Uh, this afternoon and get it out tomorrow when we can't do anything about it. So uh, uh, I appreciate the dilemma and, and uh, you know, uh, that's where we're here. So it may take a little longer tonight to get through the new stuff, but, but we've got time. This is the only thing on the agenda tonight. Um, as a general comment though, I, I wanted to thank staff for picking up on, uh, uh, and, and probably particularly uh, uh, Tim Wong, for picking up on one of the comments we had uh, last uh, at our last meeting about uh, if we're going to separate the, the goals in the way we lay this out, the goals up front from the policies and programs, can we have a, a connector between them? And, and I want to acknowledge that staff uh, did that. Um, after each one of the programs, we see associated goals and policies. And I appreciate the time it took to do that. I think in the long run, that's going to be a useful tool. Um, and the only thought I have is that there's a, there's some amount of interpretation here, and and you know uh, there could be reasonable contentions that well, you know uh, this goal is also associated or that goal is also uh, policy, and so maybe if you wanted to instead of associated goals and policies call it something like primary primary associated goals and policies, you when you do that you're communicating this is not necessarily an exclusive list, and it. I, creates potential other tethers um, uh, through the document that could be useful. So that was my only uh, uh, general comment. Thanks. Others? Um, I, I just had a couple um, kind of bridging from the housing element working group, which, which I sit on uh, as, as well as here. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that the, the sentiment has been consistent from Housing Element Working Group and here, and I, I want to make this comment now in case any commissioner wants to disagree with me, um, but there's, a, there's a, 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 a drive to get more affordable housing in, in our city. And that drive is um, certainly driven by the, the arena numbers, which are 57% of the 6,086 uh, but it's, I think it's also driven by our, our values and our desire to have a place for more diversity. And that's been just consistent. And so that's what you see in some of these comments from the community now and some of the uh, comments and um, our, our work on the housing group element group and, and here. Um, that said, 43% of the arena numbers are uh, above market rate. So we can't go to zero on that. Uh, and that's just the state of the state, literally, that's what the state tells us. <clears throat> um, so I think there's ways that we can try to find the middle of that, including such suggestions as, you know, um, you know, not do reductions on housing fees unless it's 80%, things like that, and other incentives that can be put in. But I just want to acknowledge the what I see is the whole community uh, aligned on that. Um, 
I also see the community aligned on the fact that uh, lots of office gets us nowhere. And that old model of lots of office as a prime example got us nowhere so far <clears throat> in Ventura. Uh, and that set back that project because we were trying to get lots of office built where we were trying to get housing built Instead of, instead of that, we kind of put up an office park in that proposal and it died at council and, and at the planning commission. Um, and then uh, just lastly, I, I think that, uh, and this came up in the council ad hoc meeting that I attended the other night. <clears throat> um, it was sort of a consistent thing of, of what I've been thinking is that, you know, there, if, if they were gonna put up height, if we're gonna put up higher buildings, then uh, that should be in targeted areas and for specific purposes. Uh, that came up and we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit that uh, a couple of the council members on, on, on a minority group called the ad hoc of the council uh, talked about some higher uh, buildings in the, um, as, as uh, Director Late said. And um, that too, I think we can have an opportunity to ask for more affordable housing. So there are opportunities to do this. At the same time, the HCD is only looking at units. We're looking at homes and neighborhoods but the HCD is looking at units. And uh, that's kind of the difference in terms of how we process this because we have to do both. Our, our goal line is both, is to get HCD to approve our housing element and then also to build houses uh, for all of the segments, which as I say, I think the community sentiment is more on the, on the uh, affordable side. So I just kind of wanted to summarize that as we, as we begin our discussion. Commissioner Templeton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to uh, share that my perspective differs on what happened in Ventura. I don't think anybody was trying to build office there. I think we were trying to provide proposals that would be uh, more palatable to the current property owners. And that included uh, office space that was already there and trying to replace it. I, I think it's disingenuous to, to characterize that anybody was trying to build more office, we're desperately trying to build housing in this city. So I think, I think that's, that's where we should focus instead of, um, you know, attributing intentions to any of this. If we, if anything is discussing office, I don't think it's somehow people trying to squeeze office in there. I think the discussion is really focused around what do we do to incentivize housing? Yeah, my comment was on the model used, but perfectly acceptable uh, comments from you. Uh, any others? Then let's thank, you for, thank you for accepting my comments, Chair. Um, so did you wanna start, um, Mr. Late, with actually with the goals or go to the programs? Uh, so um, I guess, what might be most efficient is to ask uh, the commission if there are any um, uh, questions regarding the attachment from last week's packet, because I think those changes are pretty minor. And if they, if, if there are no comments or questions on that, we will accept that as accepted by the commission. And then we can shift our focus to the at places memo. No, that wasn't what I was asking. Okay. I was asking when we start this discussion, did you want to talk about goals or did you want to talk about programs? I, I definitely think we need to go through the programs again um, be, f with the changes that were made before we go to the. Uh, yeah. Place okay. Level. So, so again, I, um, I think my answer still stands, but when we get to the, um, to the at places memo, uh, I would start from the beginning and uh, work our way through it. Okay. Um, so I think we should do, do as we did before, which is to talk about each one and, and until we have closure that we're finished with that uh, conversation. So um, Commissioner Heckman is first up. Uh, thank you, Chair, but, but um, now I'm confused. So, so um, if we're not looking at the at places memo right now, instead we're looking at the, the attachment A to the staff report that we all uh, received on Friday and, and reviewed. Chair, are you wanting to go top to bottom on that? And, and yeah, I know, so starting with goal number one? Yeah, that's what I'm proposing because of okay. uh, two, two things. One is that um, you know, we've had another two weeks to study it and may have some more comments. And secondly, 
um, you know, we want to be thorough uh, in, in advance of looking at the uh, at places memo. I'm expecting that, as the last time, frankly, that some of them are going to have almost no comments. Okay. So, so that would be, so I'm suggesting we start on packet page 14 of the new packet of 1.1. Uh, One point, sorry. Are you talking about policy 1.1 under goal 1.1? No, 1 .0? programs. We're not going to do policies. We're going to do that when we get back to the at place memo. We're only going to talk about programs now. My understanding from Mr. Late is he wanted to go to policies when we went to the at place memo. I'm suggesting that we don't need to do policies at this point until we get to the at place memo, but just focus on the programs. If, if that's unacceptable, then fine. Well, I, I, here, let me just say where, uh, what, where I'm coming from and then figure out I, I can fold this in anyway. So, so I reviewed the material and over the weekend sent in a series of, of specific comments, uh, some on goals, some on policies, some on programs. Um, and those were distributed. And, and those, uh, are all but one, I only have one other comment uh, anywhere in the dot packet and it's on 3.4, which I think in the at places memo may be substantially different. And so I may not even have to bring that up. So I'm trying to figure out these, these comments I submitted, some of which I, I now see in the at places memo, changes have been made, others changes haven't been made. And uh, I'm, I'd like a forum to identify those. And for example, the ones that weren't made, I'm curious as to staff, what was the hesitancy? And, and I can talk about that at any time tonight. I'm just trying to figure out when you'd like me to. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue is we're dealing basically with three documents now. Um, last meetings, this meetings, and the changes that were made for reasons that we've discussed. Um, but since Director Late wanted to start with the old packet, May I offer a process suggestion, Chair? Go ahead, Commissioner Templeton. Um, I think that maybe there's a lack of clarity uh, that these are three versions of, of the same document and maybe it would be better for staff to orient us to that so that we can work off the latest version. Would that be helpful to others? Yes. So director, director, would you be willing to tell us a little bit more clearly that you're not asking us to go through each different version of the document, but here's what changed from between these sets of documents and let's work from the last one. Is that what you had in mind, director? Go ahead. Uh, so I guess I could clarify that um, you, you first met and had this topic on, on June 8th. We received feedback from the commission. We have uh, since incorporated that feedback and represented it to the commission in your packet that was distributed last week for tonight. There's very little change because it was minor uh, changes. Um, so what I was hoping is that we could just dispense with, so we do not need to look at June 8 because June 29 included in your packet is the June 8 packet and strike out an underlying format reflecting what the planning commission had already informed us or, or asked us to address. So I think we could affirm that we got that right and then focus the balance of the evening on the at places memo. And you can use the at places memo as an opportunity to talk about uh, any of the issues because we'll be starting from the beginning again. I think what would be helpful is just to dispense with the um, the attachment in your in your packet that was distributed last week. Again, minor changes. Can you elaborate on what's the different the delta between what we received last week and what was in the at places memo and why why there was a change? Uh, yeah, I, I, I felt like I. I'm um, happy to do that. I, I tried to address that in the opening remarks, but happy to to note it, that there were some. Yeah. Sorry, so, it's worth re reiterating because it's it's a little complicated. Thank you for bearing yeah. with us. Yep. Yeah, no, my pleasure. So um, 
So again, since June 8, uh, well, as others have, have, have stated, um, it, it's a very dynamic time for us in processing these, um, these policy changes. And so um, we are under a, a time constraint where we need to get this to the city council so that we can get a public draft out to the public so that we have at least uh, an opportunity to submit a, um, uh, the document to HCD. And uh, because they're going to take uh, a lot of time to review the draft document, and then we'll have to submit it to them a second time before, um, you know, uh, the timeline that has, has been uh, established for next year. So the, to answer the question, the, between June 8th and today, and, and, and mostly within the last week after your packet had been produced, we had a substantive discussion with the Planning and Transportation Commission ad hoc, the City Council ad hoc, and a meeting with the Housing and Community Development staff. Um, that, in addition to uh, just staff reviewing the, the document again, has resulted in a number of changes that are reflected in the at places memo. So again, from, from June 8 to the, to the June 29 packet um, are minor discrete changes. I think we can, here, if, there, if we didn't capture something correctly, but the pack, but the at places memo doesn't have those strikeout underlying edits in it because it assumes that we've you know we've moved on from from that. So uh, I think we could spend the balance of our time on the at places memo. Thank you. So just to reiterate, yeah. all you are looking for from the one that was in our packet is if we dispute any of the red lines. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Rectal. Yeah. I mean, my preference would be to have Director Lake walk us through the at places memo section by section. While he's doing that, we can look at the attachment ourselves and bring up any red lines that were in that attachment or any red lines that are in that places memo, but just do it a one single pass where we kind of do parallel comments. Yep. That's perfectly fine. Um, but we all prepared with for that document that we had tonight. So if we have additional comments on that, we'll just include it in the um, nor normal routine uh, batting order of going through that. Okay, so so with that direction, then we would start from the beginning yep. of the at places memo yep. attachment A, the strikeout underlined version. Uh, Mr. Wong will uh, show that on screen as he's doing now. And um, Tim, can you can you walk us through? I, I don't think we need to describe uh, every every minor change, but we can just sort of have it on the screen and acknowledge it and 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 move on. Sure, be happy to. So, just moving through, you can see, as John mentioned, there are some minor edits um, as I scroll through. Please feel free to stop if you have any questions, but um, I will just keep on scrolling through. You can see those changes. Again, relatively minor when it comes to policy changes, goals and policies. That, and so that's a pretty fast scroll, <laughs> Mr. Wong. <Sorry. laughs> uh, Commissioner Rechtal. I'm sorry, uh, um, Commissioner uh, Heckman. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. So, uh, Mr. Wong, why don't you take us back to 1.1. Uh, 1.1, .1, very good. So we're changing substandard to vulnerable, which, which I, I thought I knew what this meant before you made the change, but, but now I'm not sure what a vulnerable residential property is. And so if you want to pursue this kind of language, I'd encourage staff to think about some kind of elaboration because it's it, it it's not this this is again this is a policy statement and I, I don't know what that means vulnerable to what uh, vulnerable to being demolished uh, vulnerable to being renovated uh, possibly falling down I just don't know um, substandard again I understood um, so and and somebody had an idea for this and I think it should be clarified um, uh, chair my next comment is on uh, two point four. So can we can if, if we could just so I, I think that's fine. I mean we can go either way with substandard or, or vulnerable. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do here is tie in the seismic retrofit consideration. So perhaps uh, the commission has another idea of how we might be able to um, 
draw that connection. If your focus was that narrow, could it just be seismically vulnerable? Tim, any objection to that? No, we can even include substandard understanding that some houses have are substandard, but yes, uh, as John uh, mentioned, that was to look at seismically. So we can we can clarify that we can add in seismically. Yeah. What about unsafe? Okay, unsafe. Yeah, but but that specific call out now that you explained it, I, I appreciate that because I, I didn't I wasn't picking up a seismic issue there, but but now I do, and so I think um, if that's a particular focus, I think it's perfectly fine to to include in policy one point one along with substandard and or unsafe. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Any other commissioners on uh, policy starting with one? Okay, policy starting with twos. Okay, I will slowly scroll through these. Um, uh, no changes, I believe, to these policies, but please, if the commission has any questions. So I think Tim on two four, we have a question. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Uh, Commissioner Heckman. Yeah, thank you. I, I did. Uh, in the uh, annotations I sent in, uh, I had asked about the word healthy um, in, in this policy 2.4. Is that is that like low carb, low calorie, <laughs> healthy? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm joking, but but only to, to point out that I, I really don't know what it means. And and we should we should have words in our general plan that are generally understood. And so is there, can staff help me understand what they're trying to get out with the idea of a healthy housing program? And maybe we can find a, a clearer word. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your comments. Um, this, uh, just as a background, the policy originated from the working group and in which uh, desired to create uh, housing using safe products, if you will, green, sustainable, safe products, you know, nothing uh, that is toxic or those type of things. So it's um, more pointed towards higher quality building material, if you will, so that uh, the house is not a, just um, inundated with chemicals, if you will. So that's the reference towards healthy housing. So, uh, yeah. Does that so? So, if, would it serve the purpose if we called it the, again? My part part of what threw me off was the programs, but what, what you're really talking mm -hmm. about is building materials, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and so, um, um, can we say green? housing material, uh, uh, green housing materials without locking people into wh whatever it is, an LED certified green? Is that a generic enough term that, that we make the point? I believe so. Mm -hmm. So green housing materials, uh, because now I get it. I, I might even add sustain, you know. Sustainable. Um, yeah, sustainable and you know, green housing. Um, it's not even so much materials as, as it is sort of systems too, right? Um, you know, we have natural gas in our in our homes and how that is not, you know, the, the healthiest choice. Um, and so I think the idea is to create a environment for in the home that is uh, free of these types of, you know, um, not just off gassing, but, you know, safer materials and safer systems. Um, so we, it, um, so maybe it's a reference to sustainable and green building materials, sustainable practices or practices. And, yeah. yeah. Sustainable and green practices. Okay. Very good. Commissioner Rupert, did you have an ad there? That's, that's the language I was going to propose, but everybody beat me to it. Uh, great minds. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then very good. 
we uh, I will substitute uh, healthy housing to sustainable and green practices to protect residents' quali quality of life. Okay, thank you. Great programs, Stuart and Green. Okay, goals three. One, two, and three. One change on replacement. No comments? Okay. All right. Four. Moving on to goal number four and uh, policies. Uh, just to point out, staff made the quick uh, change, just stronger words. Instead of support implementation, we will implement. So just stronger language there. I have a question on 4.3. Mm -hmm. uh, reduced development standards, do we want to say relaxed? Is that what we're trying to get at? It seems reduced isn't quite the right adjective there. Yes, the, the intent is uh, to have less standards in place. Well, or you could have a reduced number of standards or relaxed standards, but would you have a reduced standard? So, okay. Tim, Tim, is there a, a state need for that policy? I mean, I, I feel like we've got some pretty aggressive ADU regulations in place already. Um, yeah, I, I, I can double check, but I'm fairly certain we don't need an ADU policy. Or, or a policy that addresses ADUs, but as long as we have those implementing objectives and programs, I think that should be sufficient. For policies, I think fewer is better. So unless we absolutely, okay. absolutely need it, I think we should just exit out. Okay. Other comments on fours? So, so unless there's objection by the commission, we would delete policy 4.3. Yeah, thanks for raising the question. I thought that was the understanding because we weren't getting any um, other feedback. And just, I will caveat, I will confirm to make sure that there is no requirement. If, if not, then yes, certainly can remove it. Okay, so we're out of five then. Okay. No changes to goals or policies. Not seeing any commissioner hands. So let's go to six. Okay. And six deals with fair housing. And so those are the uh, goal six policies. Okay. Okay. If there are no objections, then we approve those policies. Is that correct? Do you need a separate vote on that, Director? I think you'll just to take action on the entirety of the document. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, then uh, commencing with uh, programs and uh, implementing objectives. There's 1.1, shall I keep on scrolling through? Well, let's just pause to see if there's any questions on each one, okay. one 1.1. Commissioner uh, Rectal? Yeah, uh, 1.1, we talk about the changing the zoning and if we're increasing the density, then we have to change the zoning. But when it's like the ROLM, those sites, I strongly feel that we have to change those to be housing only. Because if, if the landowner has an option of building housing or offices, more likely than not, he's gonna pick offices. So I would think, I'm not sure if it's on this program or it also is mentioned in, I think in the, in the HIP, 
uh, where you talk about ROLM being to ARM30 or something like that. I'm not, I'm not sure the best way of doing that. Yeah, so, so we have, um, we actually were having that conversation today, as a matter of fact. Um, I think ROLM and, and GM is a conversation almost onto itself. And what we embedded in the HIP program was this concept that in addition to the HIP, we might want to also consider rezoning that part of town and that zoning district. Um, we have it embedded now in that HIP program. We could pull it out and have it be its own standalone program. Um, and if well, we H HIP is optional, and I think we should make the zoning mandatory in the sense that if someone doesn't want to do HIP, they still should be constrained to only put housing on it if that spot is in the housing yep. inventory. Okay, so um, so so I, what I um, what I'm hearing is maybe we should pull that out and have it be uh, its own program. I don't know if this is the place to put it. Okay. Um, Tim, do you have a perspective if it's under the first program? Um, in some ways it could go, but if we put it under program 1.1, the GM ROLM, that might then to be consistent, we'd have to do all the other proposed rezones. So, uh, let me think about that, or we can also consult with the state and with our, our consultants also, the most appropriate place. But it's, it's any site that could have office on it right now, right? right? So there's other zones. Do we have any other zones in the housing element that can put office on? Or is it just ROLM and GM? Uh, no, we have a number of CD, CS, and CN sites. Okay. Um, that are proposed to be rezoned also for a higher density. Okay. So if we're putting them in the housing inventory saying we want housing here, then we should back that up with zoning change. So we, we have a, uh, one of our programs does talk about looking at adjusting commercial development standards at strategic locations, um, it stops short of saying for all housing opportunity sites, rezone to exclude office. We do not have that latter statement as a policy, as a program. I mean, to me, there, there's two categories. One is things that we've identified to be we want the, these locations to be housing and we're counting them in our inventory as units that we want housing. We're not counting them as mixed use, we're counting them as 100% housing. Those I think we should rezone. The other ones that aren't in the housing, housing inventory list, we may wanna adjust the, the zoning on that, but that to me isn't, isn't the same argument. Uh, understood, and I, I would say that's a policy conversation that your you and your colleagues may want to engage in. Okay, if you want to give staff that direction to add that program, I don't understand why that would go here though, because it just says you know we're necessary rezone property, and <clears throat> it hasn't been decided if it's necessary. Yeah, I don't know if this is the right spot, but this is the first stop that talked about in in okay. zoning. Uh, Commissioner Heckman. Thank you. So, so we heard uh, one of our uh, members of the public in, in their remarks talk about if you want uh, to actually get housing built, which I, I think is a goal. I think it's the exercise we're going through. It is, it's not a theoretical exercise. It, it's, it's, a, it's supposed to be uh, a strategy for actually affecting change. Uh, and then I heard uh, another speaker talk about the Julia Morgan building, which I think she said was moved to its current site in uh, 1919, so a century ago. Buildings can last a long time, um, even the ones that aren't so beautiful as that one. And if we, 
and 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 the rezoning that we're talking about, because uh, uh, in this in our site inventory, we have wholly avoided uh, you know R1 and R2. The rezonings we're talking about are uh, primarily properties that do have uh, either a commercial co uh, an office component or a potential office component. And the concern I have is that if you change zoning that allows some office component and says any any redevelopment, no office, only residential, what you're going to find is a lot of uh, nobody's going to nobody's going to redevelop those properties because the office, the, the, the reason we're, we're struggling with this is office use is so lucrative. People don't want to give it up to, to translate it to housing because it doesn't pay. And so now if you tell somebody, hey, if you're going to tear that building down, you can only build housing, their response is going to be, fine, I'm going to keep the building. And that will result in us not getting any housing. And so I think as we think about these programs, we have to do it with, with some realistic economic perspective. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean encourage office, but, but it means uh, not zone it out so that the only way people can re retain it is to, to have what would then be a legal non-conforming use. So those are, those are kind of an overall perspective uh, on what I've been hearing. I mean, to respond to that, the price of real estate the price of land is driven by what you can do with it. And as soon as you allow offices to be built there, the price is gonna be much, much higher, which means any potential housing is gonna be, won't be able to pencil out. Whereas if it's zoned for housing, that will make housing more realistic in that site. If, if I may just, um, I agree with that. And that would be the perfect analysis if Palo Alto were full of vacant parcels waiting for development, but it's not, it's full of built on parcels. And so all the zoning we're talking about is not on vacant land it, it, where it could go one way or the other. Um, it's on built stuff and, and where, and the rezoning we're talking about, what's built there a lot of times is office. And that's, that's really what I'm talking about. But mm -hmm. for a vacant parcel, uh, I agree that, 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 um, there's, there's no risk to the city in that scenario because if we rezone it to zoning, which is a, 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 a it can be a profitable use, mm -hmm. right? Then, then nobody has to, nobody's getting rid of office or given a choice of keeping a decrepit office building versus building housing. If they want to build something, it's going to be housing. So maybe if we wanted to focus on vacant parcels with that kind of program, that would be an interesting discussion. Any other comments on 1.3? On 1. I'm sorry, 1.2. Okay. Site inventory monitoring program. Okay. Uh, no proposed changes to uh, this program. Okay, we reviewed that last time, so we can not seeing any lights. Uh, 1.3 then? No proposed changes. One point four city owned lands. Okay, there is no one point five. So we go to one point. Correct. <laughs> Apologies for the numeration. So we go to 1.6. Commissioner Heckman. Thank you, Chair, and bless you. So um, is 1.6 going to become 1.5 or is that a placeholder? Uh, that will become 1.5, yes. Okay. Uh, so so uh, uh, I, I pushed out an idea on uh, subparts B and C a uh, couple times in my uh, markups that, uh, that didn't resonate with staff. And so I just wanted to follow up and uh, find out why. So what I, both B and C uh, talk about a building height, number of units, um, 
and the, the specific height ranging from 50 to 75 in C and from 50 to 75 in B, set back from the street. And I had suggested um, that we should quantify what that means, setback. Are we talking about a 10 foot setback, a 50 foot setback, a 17% setback? Um, because if we don't quantify it, there will be an endless debate. I mean, if you remember last year, we had debates um, as to what our existing setback next to residential meant, whether it's 50 feet from the street or 50 feet or 150 feet from the, the house, the neighbor across the street. So if we don't have anything here, I think we're gonna have endless debate um, and dissatisfied citizens because some people are gonna think um, whatever setback is set is not gonna be enough. So um, maybe, again, I had suggested we put in some kind of quantification and, and staff resisted that, which is fine, but I wanted to know what staff's thinking was. I, I think the, the short answer is we don't know what the setback should be. And we don't know, we don't feel that we have the time to establish that in, in this context and that there would be a public hearing process to help vet that out because we would have to change the code. Uh, with respect to, to B, that's got a, that's got a, sorry, that's got a planned community overlay or zoning designation. So uh, that would be a, an amendment to the PC uh, ordinance that applies to that property. Um, with respect to any of the other ones that are also listed on here, those are comp plan or uh, excuse me, zoning code changes that would also be required. And, um, you know, we just don't have that level of specificity at this moment. Okay, then f fair enough. And I understand that. So what I would suggest then is that in the absence of some quantification, you at least include the reason for the setback. Is it, is it to avoid, you know, towering massing? Uh, and, and that, at least that subjective language can in the future be a guide to quantification, perhaps on a case by case basis. But, but right now we don't even have that. It's just this notion that there needs to be a setback. We don't know why. So I would just offer that to staff as a, a, a sort of a different approach than I, because before I was proposing, you know, a quantification with a blank, either a feet or percentage, but, but I understand the difficulty with that. Um, um, Chair? So. Chair? Yes, Commissioner? Um, I am wondering if uh, Commissioner Heckman would like to hear more about that before he moves on to his next comments. I'm happy to address what we were thinking. Yeah, please, okay. if you're done, go ahead. Yeah, fine, Commissioner Templeton. Thank you. Um, and I would love to hear from Commissioner Rackdell on this as well. But I believe what we were talking about was um, that the overall height um, at the sidewalk level wouldn't necessarily be above 50 feet, even if the overall building was going to be over 50 feet, something like that. Commissioner Rackdell, is that what your recollection was? Uh, I don't think we were that firm, but in spirit, yes, that we would have some step up so there wouldn't be this huge wall going up next to the sidewalk. Or there'd be some visual setback. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We didn't specify, but that's that was the sense of the conversation. I don't know if that helps you in your discussion with staff, but just to let you know where we were. Thank you, Chair, for letting me chime in. Yeah, that's what we want the ad hoc committee to do. So please, both of you keep doing that. I think Commissioner Rechtel had another comment on this. Or sorry, were you not done? Well, no. But but yeah, I, I like Commissioner Rechtel's ex explanation to avoid a, a wall effect, right? I thought that was a that was very descriptive. And again, I, I think some language like that uh, in here uh, could be helpful to to sort of set the tone for those future discussions. Thanks. Commissioner Recto, you had more on this? Yeah, more just on the section in general. So in 1.6, we have a lot of numbers. And in some ways I like that because it, it tells the public kind of what we're thinking. But uh, it, makes, uh, it makes it sound like it's set in stone. And I, I think this is more 
numbers for guidance as opposed to numbers for the final project. You know, we're not doing architectural plans here. We're giving guidance to the council of what we think would be appropriate. And that's important for two reasons. One is the mindset, what, what are we thinking? What are we envisioning? But also it, it steers how many units we can expect out of that. And so for an arena standpoint, if you say, if you don't give a number, then it's really nebulous. How much, how many should you book? And so then we book 30 units per acre. Well, if we're thinking about 75 feet, then we can book a lot more than 30 per acre. Uh, so um, how do we get the benefits of specifying that without giving the impression that we're doing architectural drawings? I mean, I, I, um, I think we're doing that. I think we're striking that balance. Uh, I do think the expectation is important to communicate as we've said throughout this process. Um, we, we've heard community members even today talk about, you know, concern about going over 50 feet. And we know that uh, Palo Alto has often kind of held to that line. And, and um, what we're finding out is that, you know, at 50 feet, you can't get a fifth story. And if you're not going to get a fifth story, that's just one more, um, you know, uh, uh, impediment for home building. Um, and forget about the idea if you're even putting retail at, you know, the base level, which has its own, you know, height requirements. So um, I, we're trying to strike that balance. And if you have some suggestions on how we might, um, uh, better do that, we, we'd certainly welcome it. But um, we, tr we tried to use words like approximately the unit count and up to building heights. Um, and, and, and nothing about this is, is setting the um, architecture of the building. There's so many other factors that go into play that would get vetted through a, um, A, there's the legislative component and then B, uh, the actual development project. Did you have more comments? No, that was just a general comment. I mean, yeah, I, I, I concur with the concern of both uh, Commissioner Heckman and, and uh, Rectal, and I understand what we're trying to go there, but um, it, it does signal you know, to the community that these are almost like project level uh, and ready to go to drawings, which it, they clearly are not. I mean, in, in fact, you know, we, we could recommend this, council could approve this as a policy and it gets to that building and they might make adjustments on that. And they could do that because even if it were to lower the uh, number of units, because we have a buffer, they could put them somewhere else over the next eight years. So there's still a lot of flexibility. Um, and I'm not going to try to wordsmith it, but I, I do like things like up to 75 feet. I think that's right on target. Uh, and I don't think you can say things like such as 50, 50 feet and then up to 75, because that just sounds like an example as opposed to a plan. So I'm sensitive to both sides of this, but uh, there are a lot of numbers here. Yeah, Commissioner Templeton. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I want to just ask staff um, to reiterate this. I know that the members of the PTC are aware, especially those that were on the, um, the housing element working group, but just for anybody who might be um, watching tonight for the first time, members of the public that are interested in this, um, can you just remind us in a sentence or two uh, why it's important for us to identify these and why, why we're looking for opportunities to um, uh, identify sites like this? I, I, I know it sounds a little silly because we've all been working on this. We're, we're, we're really deep into this, but just to reorient us that we have to find these sites and we're what, what the ad hoc tried to do was identify where, where we might be able to get a little bit more and, uh, and to create that buffer that uh, the chair was talking about. Mr. Wong or director late. Go ahead. Director, to to director, late. Yeah. director late. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. So um, yeah, I think uh, commissioner Rectal had, had sort of hit the, the main point, which is we need to identify 
a certain number of units uh, to meet our, our to demonstrate that we're meeting our arena target. And um, our ability to place a, a larger number of units at these sites in particular uh, does a couple of things. One is it um, it sets the expectation of what uh, we would um, anticipate seeing uh, developed here and at the density uh, that's prescribed. Uh, it, it it provides for greater height than uh, is typically enjoyed in other parts of the city in part, in large part, because it doesn't have the same um, sensitive land uses uh, around it. There are uh, it's either internal to Stanford, uh, as in as the Sand Hill um, Road uh, item, I think letter A, uh, or it's uh, abutting existing office uh, spaces, or are is on large um, uh, parking lots, and so uh, these are are areas that if we can put. Um, create enough incentive to encourage housing at these locations, it means that there is um, less housing density uh, uh, distributed um, in other parts of the community where there may be some more uh, concern or opposition. Thank you, that's really helpful. I, I think it's, it's hard for us because this is different than our usual process. This is a, a completely separate process than um, what our usual conversations at the PTC are like. But that, the housing element working group for us and then the ad hoc recently um, was really focused on the sensitivity that our community has around um, you know, blanket densification for, for lack of a better term. And uh, so we wanted to uh, find ways to meet the goals that are very important to the city and that would have consequences if we didn't meet them, but uh, focus on areas where um, uh, some appropriate level of density would, would be preferred. Uh, so that, that was really the goal. And I just wanted to, to focus on that for a minute because we're getting into the weeds here with, with each of these programs. Um, and it's good to have a, a reminder of why, why are we looking at uh, possible exceptions to our norm. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to add to, add to that comment that um, HCD is looking for credibility in what we're proposing. And so those numbers and those heights get us to that credibility. But the other item of credibility in this regard is we certainly have talked to the landlord relative to their intent uh, and they're on board with it. So that really helps that piece of, of, of the issue uh, as we present the housing element to HCD. Thank you. Other comments? I have a couple on this section, but I'll see if others have it. Um, I think on item what is now F, we did last time talk about to encourage dominantly affordable housing development uh, intentionally with the word encourage. So that's not demanding. Um, that, that's my recollection at least. And um, that's what the ad hoc discussed or, or not. Um, it, it's not officially binding. It's a statement from the, the community and uh, the landlord can do that or not. I think you're referring to E, is that correct? Well, E right now says holistically study, so. Oh, on the screen we have. Yeah, sorry, I'm looking at my old document now. Yeah, E, thank you. Uh, encourage dominantly affordable housing, I think was what we had originally intended, but. Well, it does say encourage affordable housing. It doesn't say encourage 100% affordable housing. So, yeah, I think those words probably would apply whether this was 50% housing or 100% housing. But what you're saying would be more specific. So. The, the, I, think the, I think our original intent, um, I, I know it was uh, at the Housing Element Working Group, I think it was also here that the idea was to try to get dominant um, so we can use majority or something like that. And again, it's just a, a, a request of the landlord at this point, but I wanted to, I wanted to raise that issue. And, and here. Just what was the request to the landlord? What I'm saying is this says encourage affordable housing. Mm -hmm. I think the intent, and I don't know if the ad hoc discussed this, but the intent of the housing uh, element working group, and I think our intent here was to try to have it sort of dominantly affordable housing, not just 15% inclusionary. 
So I'm just trying to be true to what we we did last time. But I, if, I would concur with that. Okay. So is the is the request to add the word predominantly? Predominantly. Yeah. I said dominantly, but it could be predominantly. That's fine. Whatever's right. Predominantly. Sorry. Commissioner Heckman. So I think when the site selection came to us, if I'm um, understanding this correctly, this is the one that came to us from the um, housing group with a recommendation of 180. Uh, and tell me if I'm uh, incorrect. And, and I, uh, if I'm remembering right, uh, this is the one where I made a motion to, to move it to 360. That didn't have enough support. You made a motion to 270. And that's where we landed. Yeah, so that's correct. I'm okay. So we're talking about the same building, if you will, the same property. I'm not remembering a planning commission recommendation uh, running along with that to dictate um, the the percentage or or uh, you know using a term like predominantly. Um, but there were a couple of times where we talked about that. Uh, on some projects that went forward. And maybe it was this, and I'm just not remembering. So I guess my question, it, it maybe staff can tell us, when when we forwarded our recommendation on this to the city council, was there um, included with the 270 number, which I know we recommended, some uh, amount or you know rough quantification of uh, affordable housing? I, can I refresh? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so when it came in, we initially voted to add that to the housing inventory at 270, and you're correct about that. Uh, and then I issued an amendment saying to make it 100% affordable housing, and that failed 4-3. And so then I changed that to be primarily affordable housing, and then that passed 4-3. So okay. we did actually, our recommendation council did include the word primarily. Can I so chime in as well? Absolutely. Um, if I'm recalling the ad hoc discussion around this, um, the concern was that this might trigger a red flag to um, HCD around the way that sometimes uh, demanding more affordable percentages kind of kills a project uh, because of how it pencils out. And we wanted to eliminate the red flags and make this as adoptable as possible. Um, I agree with what Commissioner Rechtal said about um, the discussion. I remember there was something about the underlying zoning and that, that was why we wanted to um, focus on affordable housing at this site. But I just wanna throw it out there that there are some trigger words and phrases that, um, that we looked a little bit closer at. So I think that's, that's something we need to be cognizant of if we're going to start adding in restrictions like that. Well, in, in the ad hoc, both Commissioner Chang and I thought they should be prominent, uh, primarily affordable housing. But we never. Right, I'm trying to explain why it didn't um, get added to the text. We, we never took any votes. The, the ad hoc was just kind of more of an informal discussion. Correct. Uh, there was no votes. I mean, but if you are building any affordable housing, it's never going to pencil out. Affordable housing doesn't pencil out. It's going to need some type of subsidy. Commissioner, I'm not trying. I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to direct this into some kind of adversarial dialogue. Um, oh, no. I'm I, just I, trying to explain why um, some things are phrased differently in this document because did, yeah, red flags exist. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I concur with that. Uh, and I, that comment about penciling out was not a, um, towards you. This was just a general, some members of the public have used the term affordable housing and penciling out, and those don't go together. They don't pencil out, and that's why you have to subsidize it. That, and that's why we're looking at like, funding mechanisms in order to provide affordable housing, because it won't, will not pencil out, and we won't get it unless we subsidize. So anyway. Uh, that's so the question is, do we want to be consistent with our uh, inventory recommendations and stay with... Uh, whatever that word was that you used instead of predominantly. Uh, which I'm certainly comfortable doing. I think it would be, it would more align with my 
visions or what what I interpreted, but I don't think it's required. We're just saying we want affordable housing here. We aren't necessarily saying 100%. We are just saying work on getting affordable housing here. And so it's more a generic task. And, and these projects don't have to be specific. They can be, we want affordable housing at this location. I don't think it has to say, specify every little detail about if I recall correctly, Commissioner Chang suggested something about changing the underlying zoning to make that clearer instead of um, wordsmithing it here in the document. Um, I don't recall the details, unfortunately, but that was her suggestion. Yeah, I think that's somewhat contained in E already that we'd be doing the change, but um, I, I think it'd be better if we stayed with, with what we did in the, in the uh, site list and call it predominantly or whatever. Um, <clears throat> Commissioner uh, Heckman. So I think at the conclusion of all this dialogue tonight, we're gonna vote on a recommendation. Um, and we've had some you know, minor wordsmithing so far that's getting folded in. Um, and and uh, Chair, I understand you're wanting to fold in, I think the word predominantly if, or primarily uh, into establish affordable housing, establish predominantly or primarily affordable housing. So, I, and I just wanna say, if we're gonna do that, then when we get to the vote on the recommendation, I'd like to pull this out and vote on it separately. I think there's, I think there's a number of areas that we could do that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But we can also vote now with five of us that there's only five votes tonight. So we can vote now if we wanna put, uh, uh, that modifier in there. Yeah, so I think maybe having like a parking lot that we can come back and and uh, revisit some of these issues. When? At the end. Okay, that's good. Good suggestion. <clears throat> okay, I have a couple more that they're related and uh, quite straightforward, which is on G and H. Um, <clears throat> You know, I think, I think Stanford, I, I take them at their word. I always have from the uh, housing element working group and, and now that they want to support their needs for housing um, of their uh, students and faculty and, and staff in Palo Alto. And they came up with a, a number of proposals here that are becoming part of it. Okay, thanks for, my mic was, I guess, muted. Um, and we're talking here on G&H about you know, doing basically some more study, which is great. You know, they're gonna to talk to various uh, leaseholders and so on. Um, I just don't understand why we would necessarily talk about this as the next cycle. I don't think it detracts from the goals to talk about it as the being in the sixth or seventh cycle. Because as we know in real estate negotiations, sometimes they happen quickly and sometimes they happen really slowly. So if Stanford was talking to a developer in a year on um, <clears throat> Palo Alto Square and they said, yeah, that's a good idea, then that would be part of the dialogue. I don't think it changes the intent of the parties. So why wouldn't we want to add a sixth or seventh cycle housing element? Again, a lot of what we're doing uh, throughout these programs is trying to set the expectation um, for the community and decision makers as to when these things might actually happen. And uh, so it, nothing in this program would preclude what you're describing and from taking place in the sixth cycle. Um, but realistically, uh, I think uh, while it's possible, there could be some progress made, even development within the, within the sixth cycle, the one that we're, we're approaching. Um, we're not counting those sites today and whatever we go through, we would presumably be able to count, you know, for the next uh, cycle. So um, you could strike the language of whatever cycle and just omit that. But again, we're just trying to be clear on uh, expectation. It, it's not going to change one thing one way or the other with HCD. They're not going to care about these two programs these two implementing implementing objectives because it's not relevant to, to what we're we're doing today. Okay. Um, obviously it would be hopeful that they could uh, take a bigger proportion of the sixth cycle if that happened to work out. 
uh, and we'd have more than just our buffer. So that was part of my interest to, you know, make sure we stay on the case. Yeah. It's just, uh, I do not see a scenario where the time would permit that. Okay. In, uh, including that in the sixth cycle at this time in the draft housing element. That, other, that's just does not, that time is not there. Yeah. Any other comments on that? Commissioner Rectal? Yeah, I agree. Nothing's going to happen before we submit that housing element. But I think what Ed is getting at is we don't want to say, oh, don't worry for eight years. In, in eight years, we'll deal with this. You want housing now, whether it's two years from now or three years from now or eight years from now, you want it just as soon as possible. So in that spirit is that we're not including it in the housing element list, but we want to start working on it now in the near future and not eight years from now. So what we can do is um, one thing that we haven't talked about was um, sort of the implementing um, there's language in, in these implementing objectives about timeframes. So we, we could uh, establish a time frame for when those conversations may begin, begin conversations with Stanford by year 2020 X, you know, and um, so that we're not waiting. I mean, the, the intent here is not to wait to the last minute, but to have the conversation during the course of the current, you know, the sixth cycle so that we are ready in advance for the seventh cycle. So to achieve that, that necessarily means we're not having the conversation in the, in the later years. Yeah. I mean, I think Ed would say 2022 is when the deadline is. In terms of starting. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's, I think the intent as it was voiced uh, to us by Stanford representatives was that they are talking to potential, um, leaseholders now about doing that. And I, I just want to make sure that that's what's going to happen as opposed to waiting 10 years to get more serious about the talks. And I, I think it is happening. So I'm, I'm not trying to state anything that isn't. I just want to document uh, the kind of commitment there. Yeah. Uh, again, th this is, um, I wouldn't want to burn too much time on this only because it's not going to be so substantive for the project, you know, uh, HCD approval. Um, I understand your, your comments. I just think with all of these policies, and this is one slice of the policy initiatives that the planning department will be working on. There's the whole comprehensive plan and the, you know, uh, additional um, assignments that we get from city council on a frequent basis too. So it, there is a workload implication with taking this on. So I think the sooner time frame is problematic from a staff perspective, just looking, just understanding our workload between now through 2023 to the extent that we have insight into that, that will change. But what we have now is a, a fully loaded program between now and then for sure. Um, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, these, these programs could go to council and they could look at this and say, we actually want more contribution in this cycle from Stanford and make it more specific. Well, they, they had that conversation and they've expressed that interest and, uh, our response to that, you know, respectfully was we're, we're not going to be able to include that in the sixth cycle. We do not have that time. Mm -hmm. We've, we've engaged with Stanford. We've identified sites. If there are additional sites to be identified, it's going to have to happen after the housing element is certified. Right. And as I, I know I'm repeating, but I want to repeat um, for emphasis that I know Stanford is working on it. And I'm not questioning that. It's just a question of documenting that it's that it's active. That's why I was raising it. Uh, Commissioner Heckman. So I actually think that that this language is worded correctly to set expectations. We have six thousand eighty six units to try to build by night by twenty thirty one, and and that's going to take a lot of work. And I want staff focused on that work. I want the planning commission focused on that work. I want the city council focused on that work. And, and, and I don't want any of us focused on what I would call long shots in the near term, right? The idea that, that, that you know, uh, that within eight years of now, Stanford Shopping Center is somehow going to redevelop and put a lot of housing in it. It's a long shot. It, it could happen, but it's a long shot. And that's what, uh, what I, item G is talking about, is, is opportunities at the, the shopping center. And, and I think that, that we need to focus for the next few years on what's on our plate. 
And, and what I, how I read this is not wait until the last day of the sixth cycle to start talking about this, but rather by the time we get to the working group for the seventh cycle, have those discussions far enough along so the working group knows if they can start to realistically think about folding housing in on these sites. That's how I'm reading this. And, and to me, that approach makes a lot of sense. But maybe uh, to the chair's point, maybe we could clean up the language so that it, it's not susceptible to, well, we can wait until the end of the seventh cycle to even start, or, or the end of the six, last day of the sixth cycle to even start this dialogue. Maybe we can, uh, I mean, and so maybe there's some minor language uh, improvements in F and G to sort of bring that out, that we wanna be ready to roll when the working group for the seventh cycle as formed. Yeah, I was thinking more, uh, just for clarification, I was thinking more of F, even though I mentioned both of them. Okay. Yeah, not, not uh, the mall. Uh, Commissioner uh, Brechtel? Yeah. I mean, the one wild card is that leases in the Stanford Research Park only come up now and then. And so if we have discussions now, if a lease does expire, we are having active discussions. Whereas if that lease is renewed by some office holder, now we've lost a chance for housing. So. That's why I would think we should start earlier on the discussions rather than later. So I think Commissioner um, Heckman's comments are fine. If there's any way you can kind of improve that language to you know just sort of accelerate the effort or put a deadline in there to make sure that it's underway. But, yeah. but I, I, again, I'm assuming it is now, but I just want to kind of underscore it in the document. Yeah, I, I think if you just reference, uh, it says you know for consideration in the seventh, uh, seventh cycle, if you just you know uh, added in the reference to the working group, that throws it forward, if you will, to the really the beginning of the seventh cycle when right when the working group mm -hmm. is formed. So something I think that that helps. Okay, let's move on. Two point one. So Commissioner, yeah, there's comments. You had a change here, right? Correct. That we'll do be having outreach with the religious institutions about housing on their parking lots also. So that's the only change. Yep, that's good. Commissioner Heckman? Yeah, staff, do we need, sorry. Do we need the word nonprofit here? I, I think if, if, first of all, I think there's such a thing as a for-profit affordable housing developer, but if there is and they wanted to have their questions answered and get some technical assistance, I know we'd help them. So maybe we could get rid of the word nonprofit. Okay. Okay, very good. Other questions on this one? Okay, 2.2. Um, just explain, uh, just uh, as a note, anything highlighted came uh, is in reference to the PTC ad hoc suggestions. So this, um, this implementing objective was by suggestion of the ad hoc. Commissioner Rubavar. So just a clarification. So there are instances where we have um, tenants with low income rent a BMR unit and thereafter during the tenancy. I see, Ms. I see Commissioner Templeton raising her hand. I think she's gonna answer my question. You, you can feel free to finish asking it though. I don't wanna cut you off. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. So we have instances where tenants rent BMR units, but we know that during their tenancy, their income is going to increase and violate the BMR requirements. Is that what this is referring to? Yes. And it is pretty rough because we see this with all sorts of programs uh, where someone is in a um, minimum wage job and has to turn down a promotion because it would disqualify them from housing and the promotion doesn't cover enough of the cost. So is there a way for us to step back the costs 
as the person grows their income um, so that they could eventually um, you know, be ready to not qualify for low income housing if, if that was how their path unfolded. Uh, so in other words, instead of having an on switch and an off switch, have some kind of um, gradation for qualification, if okay. that makes sense. That, no, that makes a ton of sense. And then can you remind me, Mr. Wong, these procedures are set by Palo Alto regs, right? There's no state um, requirements that come into play or anything like that. So we can They're change- They're set by the, the owner, I, I think. It, Mr. Wong, feel free to jump in here if I'm incorrect, but they're set by the owner. So we have to work with- um, but, um, the operator of the of the property to make sure that that somehow works, right? Is that what you said, Mr. Wong? Uh, no, it, it is within the purview of the city to to hmm. set its own requirements, the AMI level, the afford uh, the length of affordability. So the the city has the ability to dictate its its terms of the BMR program. Okay, I stand corrected. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Okay. So that's interesting. So then, sorry, Mr. Yang, were you going to chime in? I, I guess I would just clarify, um, you know, the city sets these pr processes generally as part of a, a BMR agreement that gets recorded uh, against the property, um, a regulatory agreement. But there are also situations, particularly when you have a 100% affordable development uh, where the financing for that project might have its own set of uh, restrictions which come into play as well. So when you've got an 100% <clears throat> development, um, you know, they may not be able to keep a tenant that doesn't income qualify for more than, you know, six months or, or a year, depending on, you know, what the, what the requirements of that financing mechanism are. But the BR, BMR agreements, do they have to be consistent from, from you know, owner to owner? Because isn't it like 80% of, of AMI, AMI is set by whatever county, city, and then, or, or do they change? Like, can the city re renegotiate or have different we, BMR we, we requirements? Could. We oh, could change okay. BMR requirements. We could, you know, uh, amend those agreements. Uh, but again, we're going to have a lot more flexibility for products that aren't, you know, financed with, in uh, by mechanisms that have their own set of you know, regulations. Got it. Yeah, if I could add, sorry, I, uh, I may have viewed this um, more narrowly in which maybe I'm too close to the product, but for Albert's correct, if it's 100% affordable housing um, that has state tax credits and other financing sources, the city has certainly less a purview over those, uh, those 100% affordable units. But I was just reading this as the city's below market rate program, the inclusionary, the 15% that is set aside. Uh, and the city has a little more leeway in those restrictions. So, uh, so, so just to clarify my statements, but Albert is- Sorry, correct. one more thing. And then, no, I'm just confusing myself, but BMR is different from affordable housing triggers, right? We're not talking about affordable housing triggers. Uh, it is affordable housing. It's just not 100% financed. When a uh, market rate development is proposed, there's a certain percentage that needs to be set aside for below market rate. And this is uh, I, what it refers to in that Got it. that. that that percentage that's set aside, those, since it does not use state or federal funding, that's where the city has a little more leeway. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So. That's really helpful. Thank you. Sure. I had one little detail question. <clears throat> uh, is there a word left out in the first sentence? Is it continued to require development projects of three or more net new residential units? Or developments, yeah, to require developments of three or more, that would work too. Okay, we we can look into rewording. Continue required development. Uh, you can check that out. It's just wordsmithing, but it wasn't. It wasn't. I don't think it's perfectly clear. Very good. 
Okay, two point. Got my light on. I'm sorry. Thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner Heckman. Uh, just thank you briefly on uh, this uh, D. I, I think this came up uh, at the Planning Commission uh, within the last year. I think it was when we were talking about the um, zoning amendment on tenant relocation and uh, extending that to apply to whatever it was, 10 to 49 units. This notion came up that, that people in BMRs can earn out of their qualification to stay in the BMR. And I remember the commission saying, well, what happened then? And, and nobody really had a good answer. And so I think it's I think this is a perfect place to, to put this program in. And it doesn't surprise me at all that our PTC ad hoc who struggled with this uh, in a different context uh, came up with it. So uh, I think it's a great ad. And again, just to clarify that we can, uh, for BMR units, uh, uh, those units that were set aside as part of the inclusionary, that 15%, we can review those rental procedures. But again, uh, as Albert mentioned, we can only do that for these BMR units versus 100% affordable, which have other requirements. So projects such as Wilton Court or 801 Alma, Eden Housing, those 100% affordables, we don't have as much leeway in regards to tenants that earn over income, but we can look at the city's own BMR program and those units created out of that program. Uh, just wanted to be perfectly clear to uh, the PTC and uh, what the city can or and cannot do when it comes to certain procedures. Commissioner Rupavar. Yeah, just one more question, Mr. Wong. So how does this interplay with like RENA's low, moderate, those thresholds? Because if we're changing what the triggers for BMR and renegotiating it, that would change whether it falls into like low or moderate income or et cetera, right? Well, um, that is correct. However, this is just addressing kind of like post, for example. So for RENA, if we say that BMR units should be at 65% AMI, we'll let households in uh, if they earn or they can reside in the unit if they earn less than 65% AMI. This is uh, a few years down the line and what to do with those households a few years down the line if they exceed that 65%. It's still deed restricted at 65%. Oh. So it still meets the RENA. Got it, got but it. But it's what to do with those household in, uh, tenants that exceed that. Okay. Um, so even if you like change it because it's deed restricted, it doesn't change anything. Like correct. it's still 65%. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. And, and, and just to reiterate, this is the policy says to review our procedures and to consider the policy implications. So this program doesn't do anything other than say, hey, this is something that we want to study. And it wouldn't make, uh, you know, structural changes to the agreement, but um, for an individual unit, but maybe provide a transition for how somebody graduates to a different sort of uh, tenant space. So lots of issues to sort out on it. And this is just a, uh, one of many programs that we will be busy with over the next eight years. Okay, uh, just a quick time check. We've been at it for two hours, we're at eight. Would you like to take a break at this point or press on for a while? Thoughts? Break. Vote for break. Break. Okay, let's do, uh, I think I haven't read it, 8 o'clock straight up. 8.02, let's go to 8.10, and we'll resume. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back. We'll pick up the pace here. I mean, uh, pick up the uh, baton here. Pace is pretty good. Uh, so I think we're on 3.1 fee waivers and adjustments. Is that right, Mr. Wong? That is correct. Yeah, sorry. Okay, now we can see it all. Sorry, uh, no, no changes to three point one. But but you exempted uh, B from our document that we had before. Exempt. Former B, sorry. Yeah. Okay, Commissioner Heckman. Yeah, that's actually what I wanted to talk about. Uh, in the prior version, the the red line that came with our staff report. There was uh, a, what was B and what we're looking at as B was C. And what uh, and that B was the subject of uh, a fairly robust, I think, conversation at the PTC level on June 8th. And let me just read it since it's not on screen. What it did say was exempt accessory dwelling units not already exempted by state law from development impact fees when deed restricted at 80% of the area median income level for at least 10 years. And there was a discussion about that uh, time period at the PTC and staff has subsequently struck it. So my, my initial question is, is uh, uh, what was the thinking in having it go away? Um, it, the staff's raising a couple of reasons. Um, it sounded like during the PTC's robust uh, conversations about affordable ADUs wasn't, um, there seems to be some, uh, there wasn't a hundred percent agreement on whether that was feasible or not. And secondly, it was just uh, looking at um, the administrative side of uh, deed restricting, if you will, ADUs. So because of that, but certainly uh, if, if the PTC wants the staff to continue to explore a, a deed restricted uh, ADUs for 10 years, we certainly can. Did the PTC ad hoc have a position? Yeah, we didn't think it was a good idea. Anything to add, Commissioner Rechtal? It's former, former 3.1, former B. Former packet, page 19. Let me, I can bring that up also uh, with three. There so it is. Yep. There it is. With that was with your previous attachment, but. All right. the, the concern was that there's, it's really hard to not have unintended consequences. And so while it might be a good idea, there's no reason to put it in the, in the housing limit. Okay, I, and I, I appreciate the explanation. I agree with that. It's, it's, um, you know, it's something that if there's an appetite for it in the city, as time goes on, we can do it. It doesn't have to be in the, the housing element. Um, taking it out sort of takes the pressure off us to, to get at it. Um, so uh, I'm fine now that I understand why it was removed. Thanks. Three point two. Some minor changes. No commissioner comments on that. We can move to 3.3. Um, again, just some minor changes in um, more to um, potentially steer away from state density bonus uh, for uh, and for developers to use uh, the city's housing incentive program. I actually had a few questions that are probably review questions, but 
um, on B. Um, I think we're required to have 100% reportable projects up to 120 as opposed to drop it to 100, for example. Oh. I'm sorry, Chair Lowing, was that a question? Yeah, yeah, so oh. I can answer that, Tim. So, okay. so B is reflecting um, the current code today. So we're continuing to allow this uh, overlay. That's what that's what B is saying. One thing that's confusing to me is the hundred percent does not afford count does not apply to AMI. hundred percent means the entire complex is affordable. Is that correct? It's a hundred percent it's a, it's a housing project that is one hundred percent deed restricted for income levels at or below 120% AMI. So could we change 100% to entirely? So, because we talk about percentages of AMI all the time. And here we have a different animal. It's a percentage that's, what percentage of the units are deed restricted? No, it's the same. It's, it's saying, it's saying the, the, the percentage is 120%. Yeah. People are conflating these two percentages and misreading it. If, if you wanted to add clarity, you might save yourself some grief, I think is Commissioner Rechtal's point. I think, that, I think that's right, yeah. Okay. All right. Does that make sense what I'm saying? That 100% is not talking about AMI, 100% right. is talking about- I see, entirely. The portion of the development that is okay. deed restricted. Do we spell it out or do we just get rid of it? <laughs> Uh, we'll figure it out. I figure it out. Entirely, completely. All right, very good. It, it is kind of a term of art. I mean, I mean, when you say 100% affordable housing project, that has a particular meaning in the housing community, which I think is why it's in here. I, I do understand the confusion, but I think when you take the word out, when you take 100% out, um, um, you might add to confusion. So maybe... That's a good point. We, we do a compromise where we say like entire and then in parentheses put it 100%, right? Yeah, uh, that's good. So that, that'll solve the problem. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I mean, HCD is going to understand 100%, right? That's what you're saying, Commissioner Heckman. But yeah, right. Yeah, that exactly. has a particular meaning to them and, and to the housing community. Yeah. 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 I think that's pretty good. And then I had a question on C. Did you tell us that that? is basically this has already been approved by council, including the uh, one courtesy review before ARB. So this is this is current it code, will, right? Yeah, well, this, this is in that period of time where the council has adopted the language, but it is not yet effective. Okay. And my question on D is, does commercial reference, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, current E, does the <clears throat> word commercial floor area uh, represent, uh, mean retail? The language is just confusing to me. So the existing code requires, um, uh, so in, in some zoning districts, the zoning, the, the code requires that development on that commercial property and necessarily needs to include 0.4 commercial area. So that might be retail, personal services, retail like uses, um, probably not office. Um, uh, but I, I don't know definitively on that. And so what this program suggests, and, and we saw this play out on Wilton Court, where they had 0.4 FAR, 0.4 FAR dedicated, I think that was the number, I could be off a little bit on that, um, to, uh, you know, I think we called it a nonprofit area. And the rest of the building was 2.0 was for uh, housing. But having, um, <clears throat> That, that was complicated, right? That added some challenge for 
uh, Palo Alto Housing, as it was called then, um, to you know, finance and, and figure out what they were going to do with that commercial space. So all we're saying is let's take that 0.4 FAR and, and apply it to housing. That's what this program would say if, if it was endorsed and supported by the commission. Okay, Commissioner Heckman. Uh, Chair, I wanted to talk about D for a minute. Were you done with E? Yes. Okay. So, uh, new D, this is some you know, new language that we're just, uh, I'm trying to get my arms around tonight. We're just seeing it. And recognizing that all of our housing opportunity sites are zoned, already zoned other than R1 and R2, it seems to me there's no downside to this, right? This is just making available citywide, if you will, other than our R1 and R2 zones, the, the, this incentive program. Um, am, am I, am I, are there risks associated with doing it citywide that, that I'm not thinking about? Uh, so the implication is Um, there would have to probably be some amendment to the um, affordable housing. Yeah, it says amend the municipal could do it. I think we would have to uh, ex amend and extend uh, the affordable housing overlay, which we're also calling now the incentive program uh, to fit into some areas because this would apply, as you said, to the multi-family zones as well. So um, you might think of RM30 and RM40s uh, having uh, what is allowed by um, this program up to 50 feet in height and um, 2.0 FAR. And our existing um, FAR and Tim, if you know, if maybe you can help me out. I think our existing FAR for RM30 is 0.6 and it, um, RM20 and RM40 are a, a little bit different than that. I will note, and this is important as we get into some of the, the details, the state effective, you know, the state made some changes that said if you're building a project that has, I think, between three and seven units, uh, you automatically just get a 1.0 FAR. And so um, that's, that's in our code, that's state law. We have that today. Uh, so this would allow a 2.0 FAR, a doubling. And so if we're, if we're really trying to encourage affordable housing, um, these are great opportunities to do that. The implication for the community is to understand that this is um, uh, it's, it's fairly, um, tall and, and dense for what we're used to seeing. Okay. But not next to most of them who are living in R1 and R2. So, okay. So that, that's helpful. Um, uh, I think it's, again, I, I think it just creates more flexibility on particular sites. And that's what we're looking for because, you know, uh, whoever owns those sites, we are looking to entice them to, to build housing. And some of them will use the incentive program, some won't. And some of them may be more accessible to um, uh, affordable housing home builders because you're not competing with the office rents of a commercial site. Yeah, all right. Good ad. Was that all Commissioner Heckman? Yeah. Okay, other commissioners? We're ready to go to 3.4, mixed use. Can you refresh my memory? This 1,500 square feet of retail, there are situations where we have large amount of ground floor retail that we don't think will be redeveloped because they don't want, what would happen, what would be the ramifications of them having to replace the retail? This is oops, number C. Three, three, four C. So, 
So I actually think that C uh, may eventually be unnecessary um, based on 3.5. Um, but I'm sorry, I'm just reading it again. Yeah, so so what we've ex um, what we have found on even before we started the housing element is when we were doing the the Palmer Fix studies um, is that some of our sites have um, you know a, a large amount of you know ground floor retail and. Uh, if our, our current retail protection requirements require a one for one replacement. And so if you replace a 5,000 or six or the, the exam, one example that we had was a 9,000 square foot existing retail, um, you know, that that's unlikely to get redeveloped um, because of the retail preservation requirement. If a developer has a site that has a large amount of retail, and, and you know, there's different types of retail. I think, as as we know, um, you know, in the community, some areas it thrives better than others. But if you have an area that maybe it's not thriving so well, um, and you're forced to rebuild that new, um, that um, may discourage uh, redevelopment of that site. And so the the notion here is for our housing opportunity sites, for the areas where, that we're, try where we're trying to focus housing, uh, we would cut them a break from, that, from the retail preservation program and reduce it to 1,500 square feet. So whatever you may have, if you have 3,000, 5,000, the most that you'd have to restore is 1,500. So this would be places where we think we have excess retail? Or we're, I'm sorry, I'm, these locations where we would drop this down to 1,500. We're thinking this. There's spots in the city where we have too much retail, and it's hard for landowners to rent it out. That they should. Well, so I won't say that there's too much retail, but uh, I, what I would say is, if we're if we have a property and we're saying this is a site that we've identified as a future housing site, okay, um, we need to look at what might be preventing somebody from actually wanting to build housing. And if I have several thousand square feet of uh, an old, you know. 60s 50s built you know structure that has a parking requirement of you know one to 250 or 300 whatever we require maybe one to 200 um then uh it that's not that's not likely to get redeveloped because of the parking it, the parking no. would take such a big chunk of the Par parking would, uh, would be a big requirement on a redevelopment they'd have to park that area uh but also many property owners, and I know this is counter to what many in the community have articulated, you know, in, in, in public forums, uh, you know, those who, who manage commercial buildings and have retail uh, would argue that retail's changed and, and continues to change and that not every, every place where we are protecting retail is necessarily a suitable site for retail. And so this is presenting for us a, um, you know, one of these choices that we need to make. If we want to have housing, we need to find ways to make it easier to build housing. And having a property owner require that they restore one-for-one -one retail uh, is, uh, is a constraint mm -hmm. that we are seeing toward housing production. Well, yeah. Oh, the, what makes me nervous is that we're adding 6,000 units in Palo Alto which would give me a lot more people. And will we 10 years from now say, oh, I wish we hadn't given up that retail because we need more retail. I, I think the idea long-term on retail, and I think the commission actually has a role in this conversation from the city council on, on how we look at retail citywide. That's one of our, our tasks uh, is uh, finding, I mean, we, we certainly have residential, uh, I'm sorry, retail commercial core areas in town, university, uh, California Avenue, uh, parts of Middlefield, um, Charleston, right? I mean, we have areas where retail is thriving. Even, you know, along El Camino, we have certain nodes or intersections where even if it's not thriving today, uh, could be. Um, one argument, and again, I, I appreciate that 
community members may have different perspectives on this, but uh, one argument is if, if you concentrate your retail in certain areas, you actually make it better and more productive and more beneficial than having it just sprinkled all throughout town and, and not being as um, uh, robust as it could be. So, you know, th these are, you know, people are entitled to, you know, their opinions and I don't have the answer to that, that policy question, but these are the, the things that we're trying to balance. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I had um, a lot of concern about this section. And in fact, I'd put a delete mark here, <laughs> which you suggested may be able to be delete. The, the problem I have with this is that not all housing projects are the same. One size doesn't fit all. So if you're putting up a, a, a affordable project with 300 people or affordable project with 30 people, <clears throat> it doesn't make sense to have each one of them only have 1,500 square feet of retail. That's the problem. And it also could be sort of neighborhood specific, depending on retail. We talked about needing retail in this, you know, rezoning that we would probably do in the Rome area along San Antonio. If there's not enough retail present, you know, we, we would have to have some retail there to kind of service the community. <clears throat> so to arbitrarily say every one of these has to be 1500 square feet, I don't think is the right solution for this um, at all. If you wanted to work out something proportional to the number of units so that it would be <clears throat> still acceptable to, to HCD. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I actually, if I'm remembering, and Tim, maybe you can correct me if by reading ahead in our new HIP program, I actually think we go a step further uh, on 3.5 in, um, in the new packet. Uh, there, there's different, so, so, um, so putting the ROLM discussion aside for a moment, because that, that's a sort of a big topic on it in and of itself, but um, clearly we do not want to see retail be reduced in areas, as I mentioned before, that are, are, are retail or commercial core. So University, California Avenue, parts of Middlefield, those are zoned as uh, GF, which is ground floor commercial retail. Uh, and you know, along parts of California and some other areas in town, retail. So those will stay retail. And uh, we're not recommending that there be any reduction to square footages in that area. You still need to maintain your one-to-one -one requirement. Uh, I think in 3.5, we say for housing opportunity sites, and I know we're talking now on three, four, and we're saying 1500 square feet, but I think we make that, and this is why I was saying to become, maybe come obsolete. Um, in, in the, in three, five, I think we say for housing opportunity sites, eliminate the requirement, except if it's in this GF or R zone. And, um, and for areas out, and one other area, we have this draft policy document called the South El Camino, uh, I don't know, corridor plan or uh, the South El Camino Real design guidelines. Yeah. And in that document, there uh, is a diagram that shows um, this sort of a, the street along, um, along El Camino with these sort of hand-drawn nodes to really focus um, commercial activity. And then the space in between as being more sort of pedestrian areas. And so what 3.5 says is, if you are building housing in the GF, R district, or in one of these nodes that are generally depicted in this, in, in this diagram, that you have to replace the retail one-to-one. -one. For a housing project that is outside of that standard, um, you get to reduce it up to, you know, we, I think we may have set a number, but 1500 or, or some number. And if you're a housing opportunity site, you would not need to replace the retail at all unless you know, you're in this GFR or one of these nodes. So there's sort of three tiers that we're looking at in 3.5. And again, the reason for that is um, we're trying to protect retail in the areas where it's traditionally done well and, and thrived. We're reducing the barrier in other areas uh, for housing projects and for housing opportunity sites, we're getting, we would recommend getting rid of the requirement altogether, unless it's in one of those protected areas.
Well, that's an upcoming conversation that we haven't seen yet. So, <clears throat> yeah. And it, and it relates to C. So I think we would probably need to come back to C. Um, and I think ultimately we can uh, eliminate C um, in, in part because it could be seen as an incentive for the housing, um, the housing incentive program, another incentive that we are giving a developer to use our local program, our alternative to the state density bonus. So I, th I think in the end, we may end up wanting to delete 3.4C. And, and you, we can still have the policy conversation about whether we got the number right or. So okay, on. so that's in the parking lot for now. Uh, and then D you've taken out, it was a bunch of blanks last time anyway. So that seems constructive, but want to <clears throat> comment on the reasoning for deleting it now? We just didn't think it was necessary. I think we captured it. I think we may have even mentioned it last time that we believe that was captured in other programs. Yeah, and I believe our HIP incentives exceed what could be in this proposed or this now deleted program. Okay, I want to go back to the uh, prelim writing on that <clears throat> on 3.4. <clears throat> Um, the intent is there. I'm just not sure it's stated very clearly. You know, we, we really don't want to be putting up so much mixed use that we're kind of creating a problem. So, um, I mean, we don't want to create more jobs and then we, then we have housing kind of thing. So is that, do we feel like that's, that's clear? <clears throat> Proactive solutions that better align housing needs generated by new job growth, strive to reduce jobs, housing imbalance. I don't know, it's kind of it's kind of wordy. I just wonder if you could take a look at that. And so I, I think this again reflects a um, a policy perspective in the community uh, about to what extent does uh, office serve to help build housing as a numbers, you know, sort of consideration. Mm -hmm. We know very well in our local conversations that mixed use projects that add a ton of jobs and need for housing and some, you know, ancillary component of housing doesn't solve the problem of the jobs housing imbalance that right. we have acutely here in Palo Alto. And so we have taken a number of steps to address that locally with our- Already caps exactly and so what this this program statement is is uh saying is that yeah there there might be some places in town where it's appropriate to have mixed use development university avenue commercial down floor you know ground floor retail you know uh maybe commercial but housing predominantly being above and we have you know through our our phc process we have articulated this no notion of uh providing more housing units than would be generated by, by job creation um, exactly. for a project. Now we do not have that program explicitly stated in this, in this housing element because um, well, it, that's a big policy statement. I'll say uh, if we want to go there, that's fine, but uh, we've not, I, I think we'd want to explore it and, and consider the implications of that. I don't, I don't know what they are uh, as I sit here today. So I, I feel like we we tried to capture the balance on that while sticking to sort of our concern about um, uh, job growth. So if you have suggested changes, we're happy to you know have that discussed with the commission. And um, I, I guess the comment of take another look at it. I don't know that we would change it. So unless you had some change that you wanted us I, to make, I don't, I don't right now. I wanted to raise it for your. I would I would chime in. It seems a it seems a bit both sidesy and therefore is pretty confusing. So if you could if you're I think the chair's suggestion was if you were a bit more succinct, it would be clear that you are 
saying there are places where we need it, but this is not something we want to use throughout the city or something like that. It'd be, in other words, um, you know, he, uh, Chair Lowing is rightly pointing out that this may raise alarms unnecessarily because it's difficult to understand what you're getting at. Is that right, Chair? Is that what you're yeah, saying? I, I think that's very well put. Um, but it's not just raising alarm. It's kind of giving, if we're going to recommend this, we want council to know what we're recommending. And we all have to be cautious about that, that balance. So we don't want that to be unintendedly left out. I'll put it that way. But uh, yeah, th thanks for that ad. I appreciate it. Do you want to do 3.5 last or do you want to just pour on here? Sorry, did you have a, sorry, uh, Commissioner Hackman? Yeah, thank you. A <clears throat> um, couple things on 3.4. Uh, first of all, the, the time frame, and, it, and this may have shown up in some earlier ones, I just didn't know. Yeah, it did. Um, right now we have time frame, the word pending on a number of these uh, programs. And I just, uh, I, I'm imagining that, that by the time this gets to council, that's filled in with something on the clock. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and then I had a question, uh, Mr. Long, if you can scroll down to D. So you can see in the last, thank you. You can see in the last line there, there's a reference to uh, provides clear rental subsidy compared to market rate rents for a comparable unit. And, and I, I'm, I'm potentially uncomfortable with that word subsidy um, because you know that, that's a word I use when we're talking about uh, public dollars, basically. And here though, it, it seems like it could be read to be talking about private dollars, which is really rent control. And, and so I wanted to explore for a minute what staff was trying to get at with the word subsidy and whether there might be a, a clearer word there that yeah. didn't have negative connotations. Understood. So th this is not intended to be public dollars. Uh, this is intended to be um, uh, reduced rent along the lines of our AMI standards yeah. and, you know, kind of keeping it capped at that yeah. the the reference to comparable so so you know i think this policy or this this program <laughs> is a bit of a pain um and I, I think the community you know we've we know about the one workforce housing project the pilot project at el camino and, and page mill road so our zoning code was updated to make this change to allow that project basically to go forward. And if we thought it worked out, maybe we would expand it to other parts of the city. Well, the, you know, well, I, I will say that I've heard different perspectives in the community about whether it's been a success or not. Um, and uh, for those who would argue that it's not, um, did not achieve its goal, it's because the rental rates um, that are being offered in that, uh, that project are comparable to what you might pay today for, for that. So the, so the 130, the 140% AMI that was restricted, uh, well, may have been beneficial for a three bedroom or a four bedroom unit, because you could command a better rent for those larger, you know, units when they were designed as studios, uh, which I think that project predominantly was, uh, it, it was basically a market rate, you know, development. So what we're trying to say here is if we want to still plan for and consider this workforce housing concept, and that's a big if, I think, in Palo Alto, um, do we, how do we adjust this program so that we have it really provide relief and not be market rate? Okay. And so you would use the term um, reduced rents. And actually, that's what I had written down here. Uh, is it clear if we replace subsidy with reduced rents? So clear reduced rents compared to market rate rents for a comparable unit. Um, um, again, I, I think that has no connotations. It, it is, you know, it, it's just reduced rents. It's more of a quantified, compared to quantified term. So.
Thank you, Chair. So what about E? Did you want to speak to that, Tim? Uh, in this is staff's uh, consideration that we look into extending the uh, University Avenue in lieu program, in lieu parking program for also residential developments, trying to create more options for housing developments in the downtown area, and then looking at that same program for uh, California Ave also. So pretty straightforward in, in its description. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll note just again, because throughout this process, we want to be clear about expectations, um, uh, you know, for, for some developers, they may, for, for ownership development, I, there may be less interest in this program for apartments. There may be more interest in this program, um, but we would not be able to charge the full cost of providing parking for an apartment project. And so we would, it would necessarily uh, be a, a fraction or a cost of the full recoverable cost. So it, I forget what we pay now. It's like, uh, Tim, do you know what the current parking space cost is? I do not, sorry. Uh, I, let's just say $100,000 for round numbers. And so I don't know what the number would be for, for the housing project, but it would be well short of that. Um, if, uh, if we would want anybody to take advantage of that program. So, so it doesn't, basically this means that, um, unless we require developers to contract with a parking lot somewhere, then it would be, a anything goes on the street. So if it was a 50 unit apartment that went on university Avenue with in lieu parking, they'd pay the fees and the residents would have to figure out where to park. Do I understand that correctly? So, right. So again, the, the, the um, there may be some on site, there may not be, uh, if, if this program existed and uh, a developer took advantage of it. Uh, and again, there's a lot of details that would need to be worked out. We're talking at, at a program level. Um, the, the argument that, um, some in the community would make is that you're attracting individuals to that development that do not require on uh, require as much car usage as uh, other people who may be dependent on cars. That's not to say everyone in that building is not going to have a car, but right. um, key, key words there were as much. If that person commutes from Palo Alto to San Francisco five days a week, that's fine, but. If she goes to the wine country on the weekend, she probably wants to drive. So it's going to own a car. I understood. So, so I think if, you know, in everybody's experience, if you, if parking is a hard, is hard to find at the place that you are renting, and that is um, uh, not contributing to a, a positive life experience, you, you maybe find a place where you can park your car and, and, and have that uh, for those who do not need, a car as frequently or, or, or even own a car uh, may adopt, uh, adapt to a lifestyle where they're using Uber or the train or uh, other modes of transportation, scooters, bikes to get around. So uh, I'm not trying to advocate one way or the other, it's a policy. And, and if this commission doesn't think it's one worth including in the housing program, the housing element, then we should, we should receive that feedback from you. Uh, Commissioner Hamilton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to uh, suggest that perhaps framing it as um, that these kind of parking programs are anything goes might be more alarmist than necessary. Um, I, I think, you know, we have a lot of good parking programs in the city. We could have more, we could expand them, we could find a way to price parking at a way that controls demand and do all the other kinds of things we've done with our, um, our progress on the parking front. So I think there are ways to manage it. And I, I just wanted to, to uh, assuage your concerns that it's not, it's not uh, as bad as, as, uh, as all that. 
Um, and you know what I've heard about uh, people that don't have a car, um, when they do have special trips, they're willing to rent one because it's less expensive than owning, maintaining, and finding a place to store the car. So um, you know there are people for whom this lifestyle is is perfectly comfortable and and uh, would be attracted to a program like this. So just just to give a, another perspective. Thank you. Commissioner Rectal. So how, how would the uh, in lieu program work? So someone's building an apartment complex and they're required to build X number of spots. And instead they give the city a chunk of money and the city says, okay, you don't have to build as many spots or any spots. And then what, and then uh, the city turns around and can build a ramp or uh, build a, a lot with that money. But what do the residents of that complex get? Do they get a parking permit? Do they get the right to buy apartment uh, parking permit? What, how would we work this? What would be the mechanisms? So everything you described up into the parking permit piece is exactly right. And then as, as far as uh, how a parking permit program would work, uh, um, you know, can they park in the residential neighborhood? Are they eligible? These are all things that we would need to figure out. And there are some legal constraints that I'm not aware. Oh, Albert is probably on the phone. Maybe he, or on the call, he might be able to help explain. I'm just not recalling the details of our existing RPP and whether or not they'd be able to take advantage of that. But that would certainly be some pushback from communities that we would hear, say downtown, where we, we hear, you know, well, it may have gotten better over the past couple of years. Uh, there's always that concern that, um, you know, about the, R, uh, the RPP. So, uh, I, Albert, I don't know if you have anything else to add about that, but um, th those are the policy considerations okay. that you're uh, addressing that are would be brought to the fore with this policy. Yeah, uh, I don't have much to add. I, I think uh, Jonathan covered it. It's really sort of to be determined uh, how we would meet the, the parking needs for, for those residents. Um, I guess I would just say if they're, if the uh, building is within the boundaries of an RPP area, uh, they must be allowed to participate in, in that RPP. But if they're outside of those boundaries, uh, then they, we can exclude them from, from an RPP. And so for downtown, for an apartment complex right on university, are they part of an RPP right now? Uh, I could pull up the... I think they, I think they, well, actually, I don't know. I'd have to pull up. Okay. And we don't need to. So I, I like the spirit of this because I really think that university is a great place to live. If I was a kid, you know, a, a young adult or a senior citizen, those would be two demographics that would be wonderful to live on university. You, you walk down and go to the Aquarius, have dinner, walk back up. That would be just wonderful. And I'm not, and I'm confused why we don't have more housing downtown. And I suspect parking is a big part of it. So in that aspect, I think this is a really good deal. Um, I have some of the same concerns that Ed has about the implementation, but I certainly think it, it's uh, something worth looking into. Yeah, I think the, the we reviewed this a couple of times on the commission uh, before, um, Commissioner Recto came aboard, but the way it's written, there's no constraints at all. The, I mean, this is not code, this is a policy, but if it was put into code this way, uh, they could pay in lieu fees in both those districts and not do anything. And it would be up to the tenants to go find a place to park or not have a car or, or whatever. So unless you uh, required them to pay in lieu fees and also do a contract with a parking lot or some you know, actual constraint in the code that that would be the result um and so i understand where you're going with this uh, we all we're already getting um complaints from neighbors in the california avenue area and there isn't isn't that and um so th th as as written i don't think this is a supportable policy and i don't think it gets us incrementally that much that much more housing um i'm i'm open to some sort of car light approach on University Avenue, um, but we can't get into that kind of thing you know, at, at this level. So um, 
is there some text that would clean it up for you or is it you mean or is arrest it just, cars more quickly what arrest cars more quickly if they over park in their zones and stuff <laughs> probably but that's not what we're trying to do um <clears throat> is this easily I, I don't, fixable I don't in the I don't, housing element or is it something you just think is too big for the housing element? i think it's too big for the housing element quite simply i think it, i don't think it should be there um and i i don't disagree with um um uh, Commissioner Templeton's idea that, you know, for some people, this is going to be fine, but we're sitting here trying to figure out what some people versus all people, you know, I don't think that's part of the housing element. Um, would it be possible for us to, to establish whether there's a basis for this concern? Um, is that part of the research that staff is doing? In other words, is there data to support either direction? Well, more than anecdotally, I think we already have it from California Avenue because we get those from the RPP and Evergreen Park and so on. They're talking all the time about overflow. Oh, a lot of that complaint came before the park garage was built. There's been some of that afterwards, though, and and that is you know substantially from businesses, but it's not going to be any different if it's uh, you know large apartment buildings there. I don't think the anecdotal from a neighborhood activist group is enough to, to establish that this is objectively well, going to prevent or provide uh, housing. Right? We, it would be better to know. I was just asking staff if they knew. So I think uh, it, one, one way maybe to address this is um, since we since we wouldn't be relying on this for meeting our RENA numbers. Um, this might be one of those programs where uh, it's okay for us to say, uh, evaluate the um, policy implications of modifying the in-lieu parking program downtown to include residential uh, projects uh, with consideration for how it might be extended to California Avenue, where we can, I mean, we're not, expecting to dive into that detail tonight or through this program, but we can embed that concept into the program. So sure, we, if it's not going to help our arena numbers, then it's not worth the, the argument, you know, or the discussion uh, at this point, but it, it is interesting. Yeah. I think it's a good idea to look into it because that data would help us because it's definitely going to come up in the future. Thank you. Tim. Well, well, I think the, I think a better language uh, director late would be to, uh, you know, consider parking reductions um, in the down in those two cores. Well, yeah, we're we're going to get to that <laughs> in three five. Well, if we've got that, then I don't know. If it's this it's one thing to do. It's one thing to do a parking reduction, which I think we need to do, and it's another thing to actually park those projects on on the on the sites that we have downtown and, and elsewhere in the city. Uh, if you've got multiple lots that you are able to, you know, consolidate, then parking becomes a lot easier to build. But if you're just uh, a one-off property owner, or maybe you're, you're even with your, your neighboring property owner, um, th those are the types of things that uh, the in-loop program, uh, an in-loop parking program may help with downtown. So it's, it's two, it's reducing the standard, but also building it and, and the, an alternative for that. Yeah, as, as we send this in recommendations, uh, <clears throat> I would uh, opt out on E. Other comments? I just shut it off. Commissioner Heckman? Yeah, th thank you. So, so I, I, I agree, I don't think we, we should eliminate the possibility of this from our housing element based upon um, even, you know, heartfelt comments from residents in the California Avenue area. But also I'm reacting to what the chair is saying because the way this is written right now, it's, it, it's kind of a done deal, right? It's extend the program, right? It's not, it, that, that's not soft. That's, that's, we're going to do this. Well stated. Right. And, and when you look at the back half of the sentence, it's consider a, a program for Cal Ave. So it's softer, right? And I think actually what uh, Director Late was suggesting a couple minutes ago is, is a nice way to thread the needle here. If, if uh, for example, if we just said, um, 
um, something like, um, you know, examine extending the in-lieu parking program, right? Then that sets the wheel in motion, wheels in motion without committing us to a definite course, which I think can address your concern, but also um, uh, keep this item in play. And again, part of the reason we put things in our housing element is, is to, to have tasks to do that are written down that, that you know, staff can be accountable for pursuing. So I, I kind of like uh, that softened version of E uh, along the lines that uh, the director suggested. Uh, yeah, thanks. No other comments on that one? Director Lake and, and Mr. Wong, do we want to go straight to 3-5, keep it in order, or do we want to yeah. come back to that since it's all new? No, I think we keep it in order. Okay, you're, you're on. All right, well, so, so the, uh, the commissioners, I think, are aware uh, that we have an existing housing incentive program in the city, and it is intended to serve as an alternative to the state density bonus. Uh, it's uh, applicable right now along um, in the downtown California Avenue um, portions of, of El Camino, Real, and uh, more recently on San Antonio. And um, so our, uh, our recommendations for this program, and it is specifically dedicated to uh, just the housing incentive program, is to continue to, uh, you know, it, you know, provide this program and uh, to begin to start adding some additional um, incentives that would um, result in uh, more housing production than we have seen as a result of the program implementation. So um, what this program uh, uh, attempts to do is uh, provide developers with an alternative to the state density bonus. And we've, we've talked about this briefly before. The state density bonus conveys a considerable, considerable amount of leverage to developers who want to build uh, in any jurisdiction in California. And, um, you know, we, you have seen a project recently on, on uh, Bayshore um, and uh, we've had recent conversations uh, at a staff level with folks who are exploring the possibility of other development in the city, um, also using the state density bonus. And depending on the amount of affordable units that are provided um, uh, in the development, and of course, we have a local requirement for ownership housing of 15%, uh, a certain number of concessions may be granted to a development. Uh, in addition to concessions, uh, a, a, you know, one or more waivers can be requested from development standards uh, as well as a part of that state, state density program. Uh, we can get into more details about that program, uh, that state program, uh, if commissioners have questions. But what the, but it, it can be um, a little bit unpredictable uh, to know what developer is going to be asking for what concessions or waivers from our development standards. Some may want floor area, like the Bayshore project wanted. Others may want height. Some may want both. Some may want reductions in, in setbacks and, and so on and so forth. So um, what we're trying to do here is, is um, uh, sort of pre-establish uh, a list of, uh, of development standards that we would acknowledge up front as areas that we would yield or give concession to. And what we had attempted to do with the first draft that you had seen with the blanks was to be uh, prescriptive about it or deliberate about it. And again, it goes back to this notion of um, expectations and being you know clear with the community and decision makers about what we can expect. Um, and that's going to be informed by a, an analysis that is currently underway that we have spoken to you about already. And that analysis is, is looking at our existing codes in the commercial areas and in our multifamily zones 
and it's seeing what can be built um, under today's code. And what we're also doing is uh, examining sort of the history of housing production uh, actually built in the city relative to those zoning standards. And what we're trying to understand is, you know, through that process, we already have a, you know, staff is already aware of, of a number of areas where we think that there are some uh, constraints toward, toward housing production. This study will provide um, uh, some, some clearer insight into that, but also identify different levers that we might want to adjust in our zoning standards to uh, not only see housing um, be built from a, uh, a practical standpoint, what could actually get built on the site, but also from an economic standpoint, would it actually get built? Does it yield enough profit for a developer to actually want to build it? And then layering on top of that, uh, some, some recognition of the existing land uses that are on premise today. Uh, are we providing enough incentives so that when a lease expires and a developer has an old building or a property owner has an old building and they wanna make a choice as to redevelopment, do they hedge toward another office building or commercial building, or have we provided enough incentives that we would see housing uh, begin to get some more um, stature in that decision-making process? The, um, in our conversations with HCD this week, what we learned was that, um, well, it's good to be specific and we know that we need to be specific. Uh, if we don't have that specificity because we're in the midst of doing that study, uh, they, there is there was a recognition that, you know, it's okay not to, to include that as long as you include an understanding of what the constraints uh, are anticipated to be and, a, and an affirmative statement that you would amend the code and do so in our case, we'll need to amend it within the first year. Um, uh, we would have to do it before the end of 2023. And, um, and so, um, so we've, re we've rewritten it. So we've deleted all of these zoning specific programs and we've replaced them with a general statement for commercial, a general statement for multifamily, and then another one for the ROLM and GM area. And what we're trying to do with these, uh, with these programs is, um, identify a that this is an alternative um, and that we're going to amend our development standards and, and we can talk a little bit about what the, i've already mentioned what i think some of those are going to be um, retail preservation as we've talked earlier is one of these areas where i think we need to um, tackle that issue and so that that would be a, an incentive that would be offered through the housing incentive program um, parking is one where, uh, you know, th this is a big one too, where if somebody wants, so we have to compare our housing incentive program to what concessions might be given to a developer through state density bonus law and state density bonus law, whether you seek a density bonus or not, you can just an actual density bonus. You can just claim that you uh, want to use the parking requirements of that law. And so at a minimum, I, I'm, you know, our recommendation is that we at least match the state on what the parking requirements are if somebody were seeking to, to develop. Um, if our parking requirements are greater than the state density bonus, and that's, a, and that's gonna have somebody lean toward the state density bonus, we've, 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 we've not gained anything in that process. We've, um, we should at least match their parking standards. And they do have different parking, the state does have different parking standards depending on its proximity to uh, fixed rail or, or transit and, um, and other factors such as the income restrictions. So um, anyways, that's, that's the, uh, in a nutshell, what we're, what we're doing. And we can talk a little bit more about ROLM and, and GM, but um, if you haven't had a chance to read the underlying text, you may want to take a, a moment to do so. Thanks, Chair. And in um, just words, why do you feel like this is now better and will incent people to move away from the normal state density bonus? So um, when you say better, better than what we had written before? Better than the density bonus. Okay. So 
I, um, I happen to agree with you that if we aren't going to make it at least equal to the state, then we might just leave it where it is and hope for the best. But, you know, so yeah. why is this, why is this, why would they come? So, Oh, that's cool. Glad you did that. Right. So, uh, so I, I, it's not better yet because we don't know what the development standards are. So that's going to have to, um, uh, play out okay. based on our analysis. Fair enough. But what we're setting up is the the construct where, and and this is where we need feedback from the from the commission. If if you feel like this is um, heading in the wrong direction or 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 not necessary, uh, there's another tact that we can take. But the concept here is one: we cannot stop somebody from taking advantage of the state density bonus law. That's a right that they can do. Um, but by giving, and the typical example that you may see that is an SB 330 project that you saw with Bayshore uh, and, um, and a state density bonus, you know, those two state laws will come into play. And so this, the, you know, without getting into a lot of details about it, um, you know, that process has a, a five hearing restriction and um, the waivers and the concessions and all these different things. The housing, and, and we know that application processing time is really critical to home builders. Uh, lack of predict or uh, greater certainty into the process is, is beneficial to home builders. Um, we know that our process is protracted. We know that it is, um, you know, has opportunities for appeals and, and um, delay. And so if we can offer an alternative that says, here are the set development standards. And if you meet our objective standards, which this commission has uh, reviewed, uh, you get one courtesy meeting before the architecture review board. And you're approved admin basically administratively. That, that process change through the HIP is really huge, um, but it doesn't stop there. It matches the, the parking standards it would likely convey uh, some increased height. It would likely convey increased floor area. Um, we've already got um, unlimited density as a standard for the commercial zones. We're exploring what that might look like for some of our uh, multifamily zones. Um, and and, and it, that may sound like, that may sound some may be concerned by that statement, but I will say that many of our lots are of similar size. And when you talk about unlimited density on a certain size lot between RM20 and RM30, you're not talking a lot about a lot of units. It's a, it's a couple of units. Now, when you start getting to larger parcels, say greater than 10,000 square feet, you start getting something different. And, but we could establish a cap where it still keeps things, you know, a different standard for larger properties. Um, so anyways, it, it's, a, it, the intent is to have a suite of, you know, incentives that, and process uh, enhancements um, that would encourage developer to go through this path, which is something that we would say, Maybe we don't like it, but we know what to expect, and we ex we accept this versus this other path path which a developer could pursue and ask for any number of concessions waivers. Yep. That was that was very helpful. Um, very helpful. Um, just want to ask one follow on question. Just kind of looking down the line, um, we're going to do this like this and specificity is not required until the end of 23, I think you said. So what if uh, we and council approved it as it's going to be drawn? I know we're, we're talking about a concept now, not the actual verbiage. Um, and during the course of 23, council said, eh, don't really wanna do that. So does that mean it, this just steps back and then we either get the uh, housing element approved without that, or they say that was the deal breaker is not approved. Can we get into that kind of problematic situation? Well, so I, I would uh, encourage the commission and, and also with the city council that there should not be a program that is advanced through this process that we are not willing to implement. 
we should consider this a contract that we are entering into with the state. Okay. Because that's how they're looking at it. Uh, so if there is a program that we do not think we could uh, stand by or implement, we should not be advancing it. Um, that's one response. Two is um, our analysis is coming along. And I would hope that by the time we get to the city council, we can have a little bit clearer information yeah. about what we mean in terms of heights and floor areas so that the council can have um, that conversation about trade-offs. And I'm, and I'm sorry, and I wish we had it for, for the commission because I think this body would be uh, invaluable for that uh, engagement. Unfortunately, our timeline is what it is. Okay, commissioner questions? Commissioner Rechtal. Okay, so to clarify, we'd be giving potentially more height or more FAR, and in return, we would be removing the chance that they, right now they have this menu of different exceptions they could have. We'd be limiting those exceptions and instead giving them a couple known exceptions or known concessions. Is that it? So, um, so are you comparing, so today we have a right. state density bonus local program that yeah. offers up some incentives. Yep. And I'm comparing state density bonus to this potential HIP. HIP. Okay. So the, I guess the short answer to that question is, um, it's site, it's site specific, it's developer sort of specific. Um, what we're offering is, you know, what we would anticipate offering is a, a sort of a package of incentives that would, they would say, a developer would say, yeah, that, you know, I'm not maybe getting everything I want, but I'm getting enough here and the process is, you know, streamlined and I don't have to replace 5,000 square feet of, you know, retail in this area that is not um, a strong retail area. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm going to try to, you know, uh, I'm going to develop to that. Um, what I don't know, the reason I can't really answer your question is um, uh, the state law provides a fair amount of latitude, and, and I would invite um, uh, Albert Yang to, to chime in, um, uh, a, f a fair amount of latitude to uh, seek uh, waivers and concessions, relief from development standards that constrain the ability to reduce the cost of the affordable housing that they are providing as a part of that development. We cannot pick what those waivers would be they can choose what they would like. And the burden is on the city to show that um, it doesn't reduce, reduce the cost of, of uh, providing the affordable housing as a high standard for us to be able to, to prove. We, tr we, we collected data for the, ba for the Bayshore project just to understand where, where we came in on that. And um, we were not able to, what we found is that they were, making you know a, a reasonable uh, return on their investment for basically doubling their FAR. Albert, did you want to offer any more context or perspective on that? Um, I, I guess I would say, you know, I, I agree with Jonathan, uh, what density bonus would permit is really kind of a case by case thing, but um, I think at a high level, it is an ex it's become in the in recent years uh, an extremely powerful tool, um, and uh, I think where you know it may have started off, uh, it it may have been a decade ago, kind of more of a balance where there was opportunity for negotiation between a. Uh, a city and a developer on, you know, what a waiver or what a concession would look at, like. Uh, it's become a, a scheme now where uh, the developer really does, um, is entitled to a lot of presumptions that, that you know, the city will uh, approve what, what, what they're asking for. So um, I, I think that's part of the reason that there's a lot of staff interest in in developing something as a, a local alternative where we have some more uh, control and, and clear expert expectations on both sides. 
but the process still is basically the same between the density bonus law and the HIP in the sense that you'd have one ARB meeting and basically everything else is objective standards. So they would both be subject to objective standards and also available to opt out of that objective standards if they if they chose to, but they would not opt out of the objective standards solely based on the waiver or concession that they are seeking. That does not invalidate the objective standards. So um, there's a nuance wow. there. And, and, and so I don't want to get bogged down in that, but what the housing incentive program has drafted conceptually or, or at least as I'm articulating it here and, and as shown in the, in the programs is that if you are a housing incentive program and you meet our objective standards, and there's not much more we review, right? There's not much more input to be had in that housing project. By approving the concessions or these incentives in the housing program, we as a community would be saying, we would accept and tolerate a development of this size, scale, density, with these, you know, reduced standards, we accept that. Um, you meet our objective standards. You get a courtesy meeting. You move on to getting a building permit. That's huge for a developer. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that is a huge incentive. The other path that you were describing was an SB three hundred and thirty project with state density bonus. They would have up to five hearings, so they would go to the architecture review board probably, you know, two maybe three times. Uh, maybe they have to come to the planning commission for a map or something like you saw with Bayshore, but we're probably gonna reserve a meeting or two for the city council so that they have the ability to make the final decision on the project before the five hearings are up. When you think about one courtesy meeting before the architecture review board for a project that meets objective standards versus up to five meetings for a project that, has, that also meets the objective standards um, uh, or, or you know, is going through that process, um, that's a lot of time embedded in that process. So uh, it, it's gonna make somebody think about the, a surer path versus a, I'm mm -hmm. gonna get what I want eventually over here, but I'm gonna to have to go through this process to, to get there. Okay. Or Thank I you. may get what I want in the end, again, if we can't, if we can't make the findings that are these heart, these, um, and Albert can tell us, you know, these sort of health safety findings or, or things along those lines. Commissioner uh, Heckman. Yeah, I, I like this approach, um, and I understand the, the why we needed to pivot from the more you know detail oriented fill in the blank, um, and, and I, I I think this makes uh, a lot of sense. You know, right now we're uh, as Mr. Yang just explained, we're, we're we're in a situation where using state law, a developer can essentially you know ram a project down our throat that we don't like, and, and we we can't do much about it. So now with, with 3.5 is rewritten in three particular settings, so it's not citywide, we're, we're targeting three specific areas. We're gonna go figure out if we can figure out a, a, a deal that a developer would like more and the city would like more. Cause you know, that, that's a win-win. Now it may be that, that for one or more of these settings, we can't. Right, that 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 the things that we would have to give a developer to make it sweet enough for them to depart from state law are more than we would be willing to tolerate as a city, right? And and that's possible, but but the way this is written, we're not committing to doing it now. What we're committing to is studying it now, and then to act based on the study. So so I think it sets us up. It gives us a path to explore whether we can get more of what we as a city want by offering uh, a different package than a developer can get from state law. And, and, and I agree from my experience with the comments of the director that one of the things that, that we can offer at least theoretically is a, a streamline um, because uh, you know, in the development community time is it's money. And so if we can save them time, we save them money. Uh, and that gives them more money to use on the project and possibly on affordable housing within that project. And so that's, that's the kind of win we're looking for from the city's perspective. So I like it. Um, I had uh, uh, a typo 
and uh, a consistency question. Uh, the typo, Mr. Wong, is down in E. There you go. So I think uh, the word increased at the end of like the sixth line down, amended to increased. I think you've got a D that should go away. I think it's amended to increase height and floor area allowances. So take a look at that. And then it, it, uh, while we're down here in E, you, you see that the language you have here about parking, uh, consideration of parking maxim, maximums that do not exceed provisions of the state density bonus law. If you scroll up to the top of this page to what is now D, even though it looks like crossed out G, you have slightly different language, align the city's parking requirements to be consistent with state density bonus law. So I wanted to ask staff, is there a reason that we're using different language in those two places? Yeah, yes. Okay, can I understand that? Yes, and, um, and not, a, not opposed to adding it to those other areas, but um, th this, uh, because this is in the ROLM and, and GM area, and, and uh, I think we have two commissioners here this evening who um, uh, heard the, the city council ad hoc discussion on this, on this area of the city where, um, again, it's a subset minority, not a you know, uh, majority expression by the council, but informative. Um, and, and not inconsistent with sort of the direction that I think we've been heading, but there was the suggestion that there be, um, you know, real incentives that uh, go above and beyond um, maybe some of the things that we've been contemplating uh, in, in this part of the, the city to um, foster a, a, you know, really robust um, housing production. And, and the reason being in this area um, is so that other areas of the city may have some relief or, or, or not have the same sort of um, pressure. Um, and so by really reducing the cost of development uh, for parking, um, this added component was, um, was placed here. So it's, it could be extended to the other areas, but it was really intended to have communicate less parking required in this area. Okay, so then in E, where we're in the Rome GM, considering parking mac maximums that do not exceed provisions of state density bonus law. Right, so, so it's the ceiling as opposed to the floor. Okay, whereas up in D, it's the floor. Align the parking requirements to be consistent with state dense, yeah. density bonus. Okay, that, that's a helpful way to think about it. Thank you. Is it all? Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Templeton. Thank you. Um, I don't wanna chime in on content here. I think you've had a good discussion. Um, I just wanna uh, encourage us to, um, refrain from alarmist language. Uh, this is already a process that's fraught with a lot of, of tension and um, various opinions. And I think in, in our role, I would hope to see us try and stay objective. Thank you. No other current comments. I want to do a couple of little follow-ups. Um, so the, I did want to confirm, and I think actually Commissioner Heckman did that, that in terms of the areas that would be covered by what I'll call a HIP 2.0, um, it's the existing areas plus the new Rome district. And, and what we're calling HIPPER, HIPPER <laughs> is its extension to the residential area. I yield to that title. <laughs> and it, it goes to what area now? Uh, RM20, 30, and 40. Multifamily zones, RM20, RM30, RM40. That's part D. The multifamily residential districts. Yeah. 
that's, I mean, just to be clear on the comment that you made on the uh, council ad hoc that a couple of us uh, did, did listen into, um, their comments were spe specifically um, around that uh, Rome area down there. Yeah, I don't think they had much conversation about the multifamily component. Right. Yeah, that's right. And out of interest, when you looked at the uh, ROI on Bayshore, did, do you think that as a model, that's what we're using as a case study to try to beat that ROI? It's certainly a data point that we are um, using, but it's not the only um, data point. We are um, uh, building out models of what could be built under existing zoning. We're doing the economic analysis for whether that's profitable. Um, and, um, and then what, you know, what we're finding out is, well, if it is not profitable, the next piece is to adjust these levers to see what would make it uh, pencil out. And so we're, um, you know, we kind of know what some of those levers will be because we know what our zoning code is. And so um, that's what we're looking to. We're, we're trying to um, use, um, you know, our understanding of, you know, sort of community interest in, and what has been previously expressed by the city council in its review of PHC applications. So we have some tolerance for height. We have some expressions from uh, uh, the council about floor area and in particular how that's not as um, determinative in you know some of the projects that floor area doesn't seem to be as problematic. We know that transitional heights are important to the community. So we're trying to preserve that where we can. Um, and we know parking is of course a, a tension point um, but that's why we're sort of defaulting to state law um, on that. Um, our analysis may suggest that we may need to go a little bit further in some areas, but I don't have that information back yet. In the multifamily zones, we know that our setbacks are pretty generous. Uh, so this is an area where we might want to make some adjustment to some of our setbacks. Uh, again, multifamily zones. Um, and there's some other just sort of miscellaneous standards that, um, you know, have the effect of, of making um, development challenging. So yeah. we're, we're looking at those. Yeah. I mean, I think the, in contrast to the prior uh, program of hundred percent affordable can go anywhere. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that the hipper uh, should go everywhere that we should have designated areas. I can't, opine right now if all of those are, are right or we need more or less, but uh, I don't think we'd want to just kind of blanket say hip, hipper can go anywhere. So that that's what you're envisioning. I don't think you're disagreeing with that. I, I think what we're saying is for the, um, uh, what we're, what the program suggests is that in the multifamily zones, it would extend. So um, that, that stays the same. And it already exists in the, in the other commercial zones. Um, but I think we're also extending it to the other uh, commercial properties too. So it is, it is being more broadly um, extended throughout the community, not, not everywhere. But um, what occurs to me is that we, sh um, and maybe Tim, you know, we, we should probably need to get a map that shows where these, yeah. uh, where the HIP is being extended. W one thought that we've been toying around with is, um, you know, where a, a high density or multifamily property is a, immediately adjacent to a, a residential property. Maybe that parcel, right, doesn't qualify so that it could serve as a bit of a transition between the zones. Um, Good example. Yeah. Yeah, so we're we're exploring those opportunities as well, um, not only for multifamily but for some commercial areas. Again, we're adjacent to R one. And just to make sure I heard it, did you say that with the uh, density bonus, there's only one architectural review? With, with density bonus, uh, you know, density bonus doesn't stipulate how many reviews before um, 
uh, a, a committee, okay. but SB 330 establishes uh, that the project is subject to objective standards in place at the time and no more than five hearings. And five total? Five total. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Other comments? So procedurally, did you want us to include this as is? I mean, we don't have any numbers, so. Um, yeah. To not have numbers, right? We struck those blanks and what we're saying, and, and again, this is based on guidance that we received from HCD. Um, and I, I believe we, we captured it correctly and, and they'll let us know if we didn't, but the concept is um, we, we know that there are some constraints and we're committing to correct those constraints. And we're, we're providing some concept for what it is here. In our staff report to the city council, we hope to provide more detail in our staff report uh, that again, provides decision makers and the community an, a level of, of understanding or expectation as to what that likely will mean because we don't wanna be in the situation that you described earlier where we're into 2023 and there's a lot of upset or concern about the types of things that we're talking about. And we hope that our analysis will be able to be advanced uh, over the next six weeks or so before we get to city council. It may not be done, but it's gonna be far enough along where I think we can give a little bit more color as to what we think that looks like. Right, so they could, you, you could come back with six major areas and they could trim back two of them and raise the other four. Yeah, potentially. I mean, I think we need to be cognizant of, of how we're doing that in that form, because at the end of the day, it's, it's, it still has to pass. Not only is it feasible to build, but is it economically viable? Uh, because those are the tests that we need to be able to demonstrate to HCD. And the reason we need to demonstrate that in part is because many communities can look to their development trends, housing production that they have built over time. And while we certainly have housing production, some of the more recent developments that you we have seen are uh, not consistent with our zoning. They exceed FAR by the base zoning. They go up to 2.0 that affordable housing projects are taking advantage of the housing incentive program, the workforce housing, again, 2.0. Um, uh, the, you know, Charleston, the teacher housing project, the, you know, many of these projects that people might look to um, are uh, at higher FARs. So our development trend data is, is not as robust as some communities. So by going through this exercise, we're able to show that maybe we don't have that same trend data, trend data, but we have a professional analysis done by um, folks who can design buildings. And we have this economic analysis by somebody who can study performers. And, and we're going to submit that to the state and say, Here, here's our evidence. Here's why we think these FARs, these heights will result in uh, housing production. Uh, one um, informal recommendation that I would make, I don't know that we want to make it a formal vote, is I would suggest that you not only do the hipper, but you do the hippest. <laughs> Based on what we heard at least two council members say in the ad hoc. That, that might that, be the ROLM area. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm, I'm literally serious. Hip, hipper and hippest. If you come up with X height in as one of the situations for this hip, but... Rome could go 25% higher than that on top of it, which would encourage more developers maybe to look out there and get more units faster. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's consistent with my point of view that one size doesn't fit all. Yeah. And this is what I think you would, we would call a positive perspective on that, which is um, you could get more housing built out there if you, if you went to some pretty light parking because it's, it's, you know, accessible, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd actually encourage you to look at that as you do this feasibility study. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, thanks. Appreciate the uh, your, your work and the HCD's help on uh, giving us a little leeway there. Three point six ten. 
I don't think we made any changes, uh, a minor change, just to strengthen the language that will uh, implement opportunities. But well, th this one too, there was uh, um, ARB was limited to two meetings. Correct. Yeah, because that's, that's SB 330, right? Well, that, that's just another sort of, um, uh, you know, actually, uh, I, to some extent, I wonder if that is needed, if based on the previous discussion on 3.5, again, as another incentive to encourage people to go through that path. Uh, and, and I'll also note, I think the commission talked about this one at length last time, and, and it also was a discussion point, I think, at the council ad hoc. So, um, uh, as you know, so um, where this comes into play is for projects maybe that don't comply with the objective standards. Um, I think we can look at this one. Tim, I don't know if you feel strongly about keeping this one or if I actually think you may have been suggesting that we delete this one at some point. I think there was some sensitivity in that in that council ad hoc on uh, not giving the ARB lots of looks. Yeah, Tim, so, you have a strong feeling on 36C? Um, no, not a strong feeling. It might be good to consult our, talk to our consultant based on their HCD experience because this gives a degree of certainty. And so I don't, I'm not ready to just get rid of it just yet based on uh, HCD and consultant input. Okay. Well, Tim is our expert, so I would yield to his <laughs> guidance on that one. And as the previous meeting, I, I think John had mentioned that the ARB is generally pretty good yes. about about processing these applications through, but it um, doesn't hurt to have it on paper either. Commissioner Rectal? So how does that work when you have, I understand if you have just a courtesy hearing, then in whatever the ARB says is optional. But here, if the ARB is actually issuing opinions, if it's limited to two, can the people just say, no, we're not gonna do it? Well, they, they still, so uh, assuming, well, it's complicated a little bit, but, or, or maybe not as easy as I was about to make it sound. Uh, so the ARB would make a recommendation to, to the director, so to me, right? And if okay. a developer is completely just, you know, A, they're, they're going outside of the objective standards and therefore are subject to the ARB findings and the architectural review board, you know, comes back with, boy, that they're just, they drop the ball in all these different areas. That's not a project I'm going to approve. Okay. So, so they don't they, have to necessarily rubber stamp it. They can say, no, we don't like it. Yeah. And then, okay. you know, they would articulate their reasons why. And, and it's a decision that I need to make because, you know, I'd have to look at the evidence and, and understand the different state laws, particularly as they relate to housing. I would try to first see if they, we can condition it to be approved. Uh, and, and if it was just so far off the mark and, and the developer was just, you know, not doing their part, then we would send it up to the city council. It would probably get appealed to the city council um, if I also denied it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Take it away, Tim. Oh, okay. Uh, no changes. Talking about um, conservation of affordable housing. Uh, this just minor changes, kind of clarifying wording. And Mr. Heckman, sorry, I thought you were done. Commissioner Heckman had a couple questions. Oh, okay. Mr. Wong, did you want to finish any comments on 4.2 before I talk? No, just saying this was uh, one of those uh, uh, revisions that you had suggested. Yeah, thank you for that. Other than that, yeah, no, that's it. 
Okay, so program 4.2 is the closest parallel to goal 1.0. It, it's, it's, it's aligned. The, the first sentence of goal 1.0 as, as uh, brought to us today with the, re the revisions that have been made says, preserve and improve or replace in kind the existing housing stock in residential neighborhoods. That's the first sentence of the goal, right? This program is a way to implement that goal and it's important that it be consistent with that goal. And so we did a lot of work on goal point one to avoid the unintended consequence of having to save a dilapidated housing unit in the name of preservation that could be replaced with multiple units uh, and, and you know, still provide housing to, to the, the residents of you know, whoever lived there. That's a different issue replacement. But we did that by, by um, taking what was preserved and adding or replacing kind. And I think we have to do something similar here in the first and fourth, which is the last sentence. And it's a little more complicated here because in here we are, um, because we've got in both of these sentences, both the concept of housing stock and neighborhood, you can't say replace in kind housing stock and neighborhood, right? So what, what we wanna do is we wanna preserve the neighborhood and we wanna preserve or replace in kind the existing housing stock. And I, I think that change needs to be made in the first sentence and again in the last sentence that, that those two things, preserving the neighborhood and either preserving or replacing in kind the housing is a continued priority for the city. Um, so I would uh, recommend those changes to 4.2 to make it consistent with the goal, which again, the goal is the, the, in the pyramid of regulations, right? The goal is above the program. The program is to carry out the goal. Okay, uh, thank was, you for that. Yeah. yeah. Staff will take a look, but thank you for those comments. Yes, how to incorporate that into this particular program. Any more on 4.2? Okay, 4.3. I'm no sorry. Changes? I'm sorry, Tim, if we can go back to 4.2. Yeah. So, um, so, Commissioner Heckman, you had some language, I think, where you wanted to insert um, in kind somewhere in that. For at, where was that, Tim? No, his comment was to take uh, say instead of existing, excuse me, housing stock, and he suggested putting residential. Oh, neighborhood. sorry, sorry. That's that was a different handwritten comment that I had submitted over the weekend. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and that change wasn't made. And that's actually okay. Because when I think about it, and I was trying to think why you didn't make that change, right. this is the housing element. Right. It's only talking about residential neighborhoods. And right. so it's a little redundant, that suggestion I had over the weekend. So okay. my suggestion now, though, is something very different okay. than, than that. And, and, no, and what I'm suggesting, if we want to look at the exact language is, um, what I, uh, the city is committed to preserving it's in here, uh, I'm gonna relocate existing housing stock. So we're gonna start with existing neighborhoods, preserving its existing neighborhoods and preserving or replacing in kind its existing housing stock. Okay. All right. And then in the, the last sentence, the fourth sentence, same concept, preservation of, and get rid of its housing here, and so preservation of its neighborhoods and preservation or replacement in kind of its housing stock is a continued priority. Okay, I'm writing those down, but if, if feel free to email me that, that language also. I, I, I will do that. Okay. And, and, and I guess chair with, without objection from the commission, we'll, we'll go ahead and make those changes. Yeah, that's fine. Th th those are good ads. Okay. Okay, Tim, rehab. Rehab program, no changes. 
But some questions from Commissioner Heckman. Okay, thank you. So uh, in this one, the change you made that showed up in our staff packet was um, program A um, included what you've now called the quantified objective. So program A said with the goal of assisting 40 households over the planning period. So what you did was you moved, you, you, uh, you down here in qualified objective, you moved the 40 households over the planning period, which I don't really have an issue with. Uh, um, although I will note that I couldn't find any other program where you had a quantified objective. Yeah. So I was a little curious about that, <clears throat> but, mm -hmm. but that that's okay with me. Um, but what you did then was with a, by moving 40 households over the planning period, I think you left a, a partial sentence. Yes. Because you, assisting what? That is a typo. I can take that out right now. Um, and should just end after program. Perfect. And in regards to uh, quantified objectives, just uh, that's one of the questions we have for HCD staff. When is quantified objectives needed and when are they not? And so we can provide greater clarity on that. And, and I think just based on my review of other uh, certified housing elements uh, in Southern California that the, um, are each are they probably won't be embedded in our programs, but at the end of the document, uh, sort of a list of all quantified objectives for housing incomes and so forth. So, uh, as Tim says, we're, we're going to continue to follow up with HCD on that, but I would not expect that it's going to stay in that program. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That was it on four three. Thank you, Chair. And then uh, program four four, the seismic retrofit. No changes. Move on. Moving on. Um, program five one preservation at risk housing. I don't believe there were any changes to that. Funding partnerships. There was one change or one addition. And we'll also, in, in addition to reviewing. The CalSHE partnership also uh, to support other funding sources that are being established, primarily the Bay Area Housing Finance Authority, uh, since many of these are, as you know, unfunded mandates. So the city will uh, continue to pursue other funding sources to help with housing. Commissioner Heckman. So in this one, you've You've got three defined terms. You've got three abbreviations, but only two defined terms, right? You define what CALCHA is, you define what BAFA is, but you don't say what ELI is. And I'm not sure everybody reading the housing element will know. So I, I don't know that you need to define it there. Maybe just spell it out, just say what okay. it is. Okay, very good. And you dropped the uh, original B on Term and apartments. No, sorry, sorry, I, I read the wrong item. Oh, that's good. Okay. okay. Any other comments for five two five point two? If not, uh, we did delete program six point one renaming of R one zoning. Any. Questions or comments? Okay, if not, then uh, again, everything was renumbered, but um, no changes. And let me know if I'm going too quickly, uh, but no changes to uh, these programs. Uh, Commissioner mm -hmm. Heckman. This is more of a clarification for 6.3, sorry. Yeah. Uh, if you scroll down just a little farther there. So here again, we're, we're, we're gonna engage with housing advocates and nonprofit housing providers here. I, I think if you, you take out nonprofit here, 
you know, that, that could be any housing developer. But I, I think what we're talking about here is, well, are we talking about affordable housing providers here or just every, uh, afford, uh, every housing provider? Because I suppose any housing provider might be providing uh, for somebody with special needs, right? Because special needs is not necessarily income specific. So do we want to just say how do, housing advocates and housing providers? As highlighted, this was from the ad hoc. And so I would defer to them. Commissioner uh, Rectal. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that. The idea was just to give housing advocates is kind of a loose term. And so if you talk about housing providers, people are actually building and running it, it's a little more firm. So, but nonprofit is not essential in there. Okay. So it'll just be engaged with housing advocates and housing providers. I, I think that, um, can you guys hear me? I, I yes. Think that, I think that the, Reason we included that was that nonprofit housing providers seems to be a more neutral, whereas housing advocates have, um, you know, there's a perception that there's some kind of, um, well, I mean, they're advocating for housing, right? That there may there may be um, a slight different connotation in those terms. And I think we were trying to explain what we mean by housing advocates there in a neutral way. So if there's a better, more neutral way to say it, um, we're really trying to make this as objective as possible and not include um, you know, inflammatory verbiage where possible. That's, that was what the motivation was. Perhaps housing stakeholders? Yeah. I mean, we can strike the word advocates. That's um, and we don't have to decide here. That's just what the the gist of it was. And you guys can work on that with your team. I mean, we don't have to decide it here. Okay. Very good. Well, we'll uh, think of something else. Uh, or replace an alternative word for advocates. All right. Very good. Six four. Minor revision. But you're keeping, uh, you're saying including housing providers still? You said that you're gonna swap out a term for advocates. Oh, it, it, so this would be engage with housing and uh, housing providers. Okay. But advocates understand it would be replaced by a, a more neutral term, if you will. Okay. Yep. Both phrases, I think, uh, Commissioner. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. This is 6 4. So uh, moving on. If there are no questions, uh, I, I have one one point. Uh, in the housing element work group that we looked at, this is uh, six the multifamily housing uh, number A or letter A, uh, exempting FAR for three or more bedrooms. Uh, the housing consultant said they had some data that showed how effective that was or it was one of my concerns is are there unintended consequences of this i think it sounds like a really good idea but i would like to learn and so if we i'm not sure you know if we we're voting on this tonight then that's kind of obe but it may be useful especially for council to, to Did, have the data didn't the consultant say it was positive data she said she she said yes but i said well what, what do you mean oh <laughs> And so we never got any results. It'd be nice to say what what uh, cities' experiences were with this. 
Yeah. And we, we can do that. We've had a follow-up conversation just internally about this one as well. I, I don't think it's a blanket exemption and, and maybe we want to maybe just modify the language a little bit to suggest, you know, some kind of FAR credit as opposed to, you know, a straight exemption, because, you know, maybe if you're doing a three bedroom unit, you get some yeah. kind of relief for that floor area, maybe 25% of that floor area is discounted. Yeah. If you're doing a four bedroom, maybe you get a little bit more, you know, something that just gives a, you know, somebody a, like a reason to want to build a larger unit perhaps. So, um, but we'll talk to our, our contract or a consultant as well. Okay. Um, and maybe just add a little bit more nuance to that language. So it just doesn't read like a complete sort of, you know, giveaway on, yep. on larger units. Yeah. It'd be nice to know. Did they find that 50% was good enough or did they have to go hundred percent FAR yep. exemption? We don't know. Okay. 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 Very good. Thank you, Commissioner Rechtal. Uh, homeless prevention program. There was a change based on, again, another a um, ad hoc suggestion um, to expand this particular program. I'll let you read that. It's geographically and potentially expanding services. My one comment is I want to make sure that the wording is such that it doesn't sound like we're just opening up the facilities. This would be supervised because you always hear of homeless run amok, right? Coverly itself had issues with homeless a few years ago. So I would want to make sure that we say that as supervised. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm still not super clear on this and I'm only sharing it because maybe there's some opportunity for clarification or maybe I'm not the only one. Um, but I don't know how that prevents homelessness. I think that's a response to homelessness. I mean, it, what, at least the programs that I'm familiar with, the purpose is that you don't want these people sleeping in the streets. Cause once someone starts sleeping in the streets, they're much more likely to be homeless for a long periods of time. And so people who are kicked out of their apartments are, are found places where they can park safely and have a normal life. And then part of the program is to transition them back into an apartment. That's the goal. And so you really are preventing them from sleeping on the streets. Um, all, all of that I understand, but if they're using these services, they have probably already, you know, some definition of homeless uh, or unhoused due to sleeping in their vehicles or whatnot. So I'm wondering if the title should be homelessness prevention and something else program, right? Like, Transition? Transition, I love that, right? Something like that, just to, okay. otherwise it seems somewhat out of place. And I understand what we're trying to say is not only do we wanna reduce the number of people that are entering homelessness, but we also want to reduce the amount of time they spend unhoused, right? So okay. just a little nuance in the title would, would satisfy my, my comment, thank you. Okay. Anything else on six five? Oop, then we got transitional in six six though. Commissioner Templeton. Trying to part, so. That that's just what confuses me is, is is I guess there's some overlap in in how these go and yeah that we hit this in the in the ad hoc as well like it, there's more. These are services. How about? Um, Instead of transition, how about homeless? Something to do with services that we're offering to people who are unhoused. You guys, we don't have to wordsmith it here. That's just the extent of my feedback. Is if we're going to include um, things that that aren't that are for people who have already entered unhoused situation, we should title it properly. Okay. Okay, very good. 
So we're okay with six, six. Six, six. Um, another ad hoc suggestion is uh, look into using home key funding to convert hotels in the city for um, transitional or supportive uh, housing opportunities. And, and maybe I'll just clarify, I don't think the ad hoc was that specific, but uh, there was a reference to Mountain View. Yeah. And when we looked at Mountain View's program, this is what... Oh, they use home key? Oh. Yes. Yeah, uh, they used home key funding to purchase their two hotels. So okay. This, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for a uh, one quick comment there for a you know an eight year plan, we might want to reference home key uh, or similar funding sources, so it's not just targeted to that one organization. Okay, is is home key? It's it may be state budgets, but your point still stands, chair. Similar. Okay. Anything else on six six? We're going to six seven. Okay. Six seven alternative housing. We did a, a minor modification in that uh, further research revealed that the county has suspended their shared housing program. Therefore, we just revised it to say HIP housing or similar house sharing service. And I think um, that is the only change. I had a comment on okay, that. Okay, yeah, Commissioner Rupavar. Thank you. Um, do we wanna change that to facilitate shared housing arrangements? Cause reading it, it sounds like the city is gonna provide the housing arrangements. So coordinate with HIP housing or similar housing services to facilitate shared housing arrangements. Yeah, good, good fix. Yeah, agreed. Okay. Thank you. Thank so you. This, this will become facilitate. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Director Light would be in big trouble if we use that right now. Provide. <laughs> provide. So you bailed them out. That's good. Um, I, I have a question on number C. Um, it's very long, but well, could you just tell us how that compares to the current situation? Because we're going to amend the zoning ordinance. Is it just definitions? Is it just syncing up with California definitions? Yes, this is more um, based on, on those number of uh, housing legislative changes that we need to respond to in regards to these definitions, correct? Okay. And we'll, we'll tighten that up. It looks like there's some redundancy in there. Different definitions for the, okay, yes. All right, very good. And fair housing services, no additional changes. Well, there we go. Oh, I'm sorry. A any questions on 6-9? Or 6-8, I should say. Not um, nope. moving on. Firmly furthering fair housing. Uh, just in reviewing, we did make a change in the rent stabilization. This was, uh, the change was made based on following council direction. And these, all these items were based on council direction, except for rent stabilization. So that was removed. And then again, another ad hoc suggestion that we placed in. Commissioner Heckman. Yes, I, I'm interested in hearing from the ad hoc, the thoughts behind adding D. Yeah. Thought was, uh, first of all, I was not familiar with the state's 10% requirement. They give you is that a requirement that if you raise it more than 10%, you have to give 90 days notice? Yeah, Tim, that's correct, right? 
Correct. That's from 1482, I believe. SB. Okay. Yeah. And um, what what this was was if if the purpose of the rent stabilization was to prevent gouging, uh, one way around that is let the market enforce that. And if if you're giving someone 30 days notice, they may have a hard time finding a new place. And so increasing that to 90 days notice would allow them to more easily move out of a place that was gouging them. That was the purpose of the, and the 6% was arbitrary. We didn't do any research or figure out what the optimal amount was, but that was the spirit of this. Yeah, And, and, and so whether this would be 6%, 7%, 8%, I, I don't have strong feelings about that, but I did think that preventing large, um, Large rent increases on short notice, I thought would be a good thing. And can you reiterate again uh, on staff side what, what the number of days is for the state requirement? Is 90? Yes, and, and uh, apologies to the ad hoc. I, I, I learned my, from uh, Tim myself about the state requirement, so I didn't have that information when we got together. No, no, it's fine. It's just, it's worth clarifying. Um, you know, Palo Alto has some, um, is an outlier in terms of our rents um, in the Bay Area and in the state. So um, it may be appropriate for us to look at a lower threshold. Uh, I think the 90 day requirement is the critical part here. So if you, um, you know, find some reason amongst staff to, to, uh, change that percent uh you know that's up to you guys but i think keith's right uh, commissioner rectal is right that we are really focused on um, giving people enough time to change we're seeing that's not always the case it's happening here even if it is state law so we need to to think about uh, enforcement as well <clears throat> so um, i appreciate the is there more ad hoc? You know, that was my initial question is what was the thinking? Now I think I've heard it. So mm -hmm. I'd like to react. Um, I'm, 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 I'm hesitant to, you know, we, um, uh, particularly without uh, studying the issue and knowing what other jurisdictions have done. Um, uh, for example, one of the things we learned when we went uh, through our recent uh, tenant uh, issues was that even though this is referring to uh, there's a state 10% requirement in a lot of the housing uh, state law limits them to, I think uh, uh, maybe a 5% or a 5% plus CPI uh, increase. And so they never get the, all of that housing under state law never gets to a 10% increase. But in this language here, we're not making the same distinction. And, and that may be problematic. I think that's so, the 5% by plus CPI is a short term. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that's right, but, okay. but, and I don't think we're gonna be able to figure that out tonight. What, what, um, what I would suggest is that this is one of those where rather than state what we're gonna do, let's state that we're gonna look into it. Um, so, you know, explore, um, requiring 90 days notice for uh, a less than the 10% requirement imposed by state law, something like that, that again, puts us on a path to look into it, to, to get the data and to find out what our, what our neighboring cities that have similar issues are doing. Um, and then uh, I just think that's a better approach. I, I would add um, that if I'm remembering correctly, some of these laws also don't apply to small landlords. Um, and uh, it's, it's this kind of turnover that in, ha has people in Palo Alto entering homelessness because um, generally if they're living here, they're invested either in schools or some other reason uh, that they can't just up and move on a very short notice. So um, I, I would say if we do change it to explore language, um, I'm happy to keep the 90 days, but I would also um, explore 
you know, uh, if, if state law does have exemptions for small uh, property owners, in other words, people with two properties or less or something like that, that we explore closing that loophole within Palo Alto. Thank you. I think these are <clears throat> good ideas from uh, Commissioner Heckman and, uh, and Templeton. Uh, just because it happened today, I have a bizarre case that my son had to move and his girlfriend in like 48 hours because of violence in the building. Uh, they could not have done that without Bank of Dad. Um, Absolutely. Doing, doing bridge loans um, because they are, you know, relatively low, low income. Um, so there, there is definitely a need here <clears throat> and they're happily ensconced tonight in a new place, but, uh, that, that, that's a good story, but <laughs> all of them aren't so good. So. And chair, I also just wanted to mention the, the renumbering that, uh, Mr. Wong, you've done consistently through what's now new six, eight just needs to be continued in the last three programs, uh, okay. which will be become nine, 10 and 11. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then I'll just, since the new numbering's off, I'll just address the fair housing program. Oh, I'm sorry. Any additional comment? If not, uh, fair housing program, no, no changes. Community outreach, there were no changes. Sorry, scrolling a little fast. Um, and that concludes it. Those are all the programs. Okay. So let's see what's in the parking lot. Right. So let's see. There was uh, an initial discussion about the GM ROLM and whether we wanted to have a separate program uh, to rezone that area of the city, not all of the GM ROLM, but just that portion near the freeway and a couple of key roads. Uh, so that's one question. Um, there was some question dealing with the Stanford lands and using the word predominant. I don't know if we concluded on that on item E and then two other ones related to uh, program 3.4. So do you want to uh, start with the policy conversation on whether we want to pull out a separate program for GM or, or ROLM? Yep, we can start there. But I had inadvertently made a comment on that about coming up with a hippest program. So you can decide if that's sufficient. Uh, it's pretty general, so you can design whatever you want. But. Yeah, and so, so, the, so the concept is, um, okay, so I guess what would be helpful to know is from the Planning Commission, do you believe if you have the, if you feel like you could even make this, dis, you know, discuss this decision tonight, um, that we should be that we should uh, rezone the GM and ROLM zoning designation in you know this part of the city, uh, East Charleston Road, East Middle East uh, Meadow Circle. You know, kind of extending along West Bay Shore a little bit. Um, should that be, should we explore rezoning that to residential RM30, for instance? And then whether you do or don't, there's also the hippest um, uh, program that could be extended into that, whether it stays ROLM or if it gets rezoned. I think I have heard from different folks an interest in rezoning that area. Um, if we do, then that eliminates the commercial opportunities that would be established anew. You would have non-conforming uses in that area. And, um, uh, but as somebody's thinking about redevelopment, you know, you, you know, they would, the housing would be the option if you rezoned it, even if you didn't rezone it, you know, it may be that the housing incentives that are being offered through, the, the HIP uh, may encourage somebody to redevelop toward housing. 
I would expect that to be the case. Yeah, this one seems to me to need a map. I was just about to ask, Chair. I yeah. totally agree. Yeah, because because we say Rome, that's pretty big. Um, you know, there was some discussion in that ad hoc, which sort of kicked off this discussion. The 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 PTC ad hoc, not the I'm sorry, the council ad hoc, not the PTC ad hoc. That there was room for maybe some significant height over there, right by um, San Antonio, but they weren't talking maps either. You know, so. I wouldn't think that what we would do on San Antonio would be the same as what we would do by the, by the JCC. Right. Even though they're both Rome. So I don't know that we can parse that tonight. Yeah. Understood. Uh, and, and I agree. I think there's other areas, even throughout that ROLM area, as you go further, maybe North, um, where it abuts R1 zoning, where you wouldn't want to convey the same, heights that you might in other parts of the area. So, um, so to me, the process is similar to what you're going to have to do with the hip hipper and hippest um, to figure out what areas should have which of those zonings or programs in, in place there. And that's going to take a little time. Just for a little oh. reference, this is the interactive uh, showing. It doesn't show the zoning, but it gives you some reference. Yeah. So let me zoom in. Yeah, that's excellent. So this is ROLM, and these are those GM areas. So gives you a general idea. And and San Antonio, show us San Antonio there. I, I think I can see it, but if you could put your cursor on there. Yeah, San Antonio. And, yeah, and exactly. So it, it could be, for example, to the right of that would be something that would be amenable to um, – more height, whereas to the left and south of that, it's not. And if it's all ROLM, then we'd have to do that on a kind of a neighborhood basis. And, and this, <clears throat> this is just showing um, our opportunity sites. It doesn't show all of the ROLM zoning designation, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Just, just to keep in mind, I believe we discussed this at the ad hoc as well, but um, some of these are um, Bayland approach like they may interfere with wildlife. We don't, we don't know exactly which ones, probably more the orange ones than the green ones, but um, like it's, we don't have a lot of information here about what the limitations are. I think we're just trying to be open-minded about what, what maybe we could do if, if we investigate further. Yep, fair enough. And it seems like that's where we are again, is that we should say we should investigate uh, the possibility of whatever you want to call it, you know, height increases beyond hip in that designated area that you would have to demarcate for us. Or if this has to move to council, then you would have to demar demarcate it for council in, in uh, four weeks. So, so what we have now in the program is that it's under the HIP that says consider extending, you know, or not consider, but extend the HIP to ROLM GM and also, um, you know, consider rezoning this area to residential. So we, we have that program. One could argue that it's not neatly aligned in the HIP section that maybe it ought to get pulled out and be somewhere else. Um, but maybe it doesn't. That, I think that's probably right because it's distinctive enough and you are going to put a hard mark around there. I mean, that would be my original in, in okay, inclination. So, so if we pull it out, we would probably put it under program 1.5. Which is a blank program at the moment with four standard. Just for convenience. That's right. <laughs> Reserved. Um, unless Tim, you have another idea of where that might go. No, I I, I think um, one five is all about adequate sites or for housing production. So, you no, know, I think one five would be appropriate. Okay, because that would that would give council something to, to debate. Okay, so uh, we would say consider, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right. 
And then, Commissioner uh, Hedman, yeah, Commissioner I wanted to Hedman. ask about this. I've been, I've been listening, but I'm having a hard time following along. So we've been talking in the parking lot about 3.5 E, right? Well, right, right. Well, so it we but had the right now. It's located at 3.5 E. Yeah, we had the conversation before that, but yes. But but just now, the thing that we're talking about maybe moving to 1.5. Is it 3.5 E not, or something not the, else? Not the entirety of it. So 3.5 E would stay intact. Um, let's see. Yeah, 3.5 E would stay intact. 3.5, I'm sorry, 3.5 E, if you read that section in this the middle, it says after Loma Verde, Avenue, it says, and consider rezoning um, properties in this area for multifamily residential housing, i.e. RM30. Right. We would pull that piece out and make that into its own program, you know, consider, and we would define the area, rezoning this area to RM30 or, or something similar. Okay. So we pull that clause out of E, we throw it over to 1.5 or some other place. Right. And then do we keep the rest of the paragraph in E starting the housing yeah. incentive program? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I got it. Thank yeah. you. Because the idea is we're creating a whole different area that's not covered necessarily by HIPR. Right. Okay. And whatever we're going to write in 1.5 would design, would create um, perhaps other height standards and parking light and so on, as was discussed in the council ad hoc. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so then the next one, just right next to 1.5 is 1.6 E. And uh, the commission was having a conversation about what to do with how much affordable on uh, at uh, the transit center. And to chime in, it was approved as predominantly, specifically that word. Approved by the housing element working group or? Uh, the council. I think it's actually primarily. Oh, primarily? Oh, I'm sorry. So, so, so you're saying that was the wording that we recommended and, and that they adopted in the uh, housing sites section? Just trying to confirm that. Yes, that's correct. So it seems to me like that we should be consistent, but. I'm cool with that. Should be primarily sure. developed as affordable. Okay, primarily, excuse me, not predominantly. Commissioner Templeton was in, um, Commissioner Heckman. Yeah, so I would like to vote on this separately. I, I wanna be consistent. And when this was in front of the PTC, um, uh, I expressed concerns about um, unintended consequences and, and uh, dictating without study what predominantly or primarily affordable is, is going to mean to the likelihood of development. So I wasn't in favor of it. As, as uh, uh, Commissioner Rechtal pointed out, I was on the, the um, losing side of that particular motion, but I want to vote again here so I can be consistent. Yeah, I, I, I definitely understand your perspective and it could impact the development, but um, the current language could impact the development as well because the landlord has not agreed to develop any affordable housing there. So um, I think it's a perfectly acceptable um, stance. Also, if council's already voted on it, like then it's water under the bridge. Yeah, so so we can let's just get through all these and then we can vote on that one um, separately. Uh, I just wanted to make one other comment um, since we're in this section uh, around 27. There was a public comment on uh, on the Julia Morgan building, and there has been no discussion about that from to my knowledge between the applicant, the housing working group, or here. So that's I don't see that at this point that that's in our purview. Um, there, there's no question we would preserve that building, but uh, I wasn't aware of concerns about potentially moving that building. 
although I was involved in those discussions on the uh, Parks Commission uh, quite seriously because of where they wanted to move it. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think that would just be in the context of the of the uh, owner, Sanford, deciding if they wanted to do a project there at all. And if so, how they could work around that building or if not, how they could move it. But that's kind of years down the line. So to me, that's not in our purview. But if anybody disagrees, we can take a stance on that. But. I agree with you, Chair. I agree. Okay. Okay. Um, 3.4, program 3.4C. Uh, this staff is recommending that we delete it. The whole bullet? Yes. Didn't, didn't seem to be much pushback on that that concept of taking it out. Yeah. I'm fine with that. That's actually what I had in my notes. Okay. And 3.4E. Uh, this is just, um, I think we were just going to soften this language a little bit. So I think we have that direction actually. Um, there was some debate as to whether to keep it in or not, or there was some concern about keeping it in. And I think Commissioner Heckman had suggested we soften the language. And I think softening language is appropriate. Okay. It's okay. Yep. All right. That is all I have on the parking list. Where, where was Inlu Housing? Inlu Housing. That would be one of our earlier programs. Yeah, like that's what we're talking about right now. In the parking, three four eight. That was the. Sorry, I was on. I was on. I was on three three. So, what's the language going to be? Uh, we don't have it, but it would be, you know, um, extending. Yeah, I, I, I had suggested explore extending. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Chair, I don't have any other items in the parking lot. I'm gonna ask this in an appreciative way, Director Light. Would you want us to look at the um, new HIP programs before they go to council, say at the next meeting? Well, I don't think we're gonna have it all dialed in uh, by the 13th. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're just starting in on, um, you know, we've done the basic analysis of existing zoning and, yeah. and we're going to have some no, time you, to- you, you drive it. I'm not questioning okay. that at all. I'm just saying if you would benefit from that, if you were ready, that would be okay. But uh, I, I wish we were a few months, you know, although I don't know, those last okay. couple of months were pretty rough, but- um. <laughs> All right. So as Commissioner Templeton to speak, your hands up. Thank you. I, are we ready to make a motion? I'm happy to do so. Any objections? Seems, seems promising. All right, let's except, do it. Except there's that one item that we're going to call out, which I can't remember. Uh, do you, if you can remind me after I make the motion what the number is, we'll call it out. So I move that we recommend to the city council the 2023 to 2031 housing element draft goals, policies, programs, and implementing objectives document as revised in our meeting tonight, with the exception of? Uh, it would be 16E. 16E to be voted on separately. Okay, great. Second, a second? Second. Okay, Mr. Rechtal was seconded. Good job, everybody. That's my comments. <laughs> yeah, so. We need, to, we need to vote on this motion as is and then come back to 16E and get a separate vote on that. So uh, we do need to put this to a roll call vote, which I think can be, well, it's up to you, Commissioner Ackman, but the way it's written, it could be 7-0 on this. We don't have seven at, commissioners. At least 5-0. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> They're with us in spirit. Yeah. yeah. Would you please call the roll? Commissioner Hackman? Yes. 
Chair Lawing. Yes. Commissioner Regdal. Yes. Commissioner Rupervar. Yes. Commissioner Templeton. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Great. Thank you. So in light of that message, uh, the last mess motion, we don't need a separate motion. We just have to vote on the dissension, essentially. Well, I, I would think you would want now a motion to approve 1.6 E with the word either predominantly or okay. primarily, whichever it is. All right. And then okay. we can that's fine. vote on that. That's, that. that's good. That's better. Uh, so I won't make that motion, but one of you. Can. I was guessing that. <laughs> I would advise any motion makers to um, explain in your motion that you're aligning with council's language. Commissioner Rectal, would you like the privilege? Okay. Let's see. So I would like to move to accept program 16, let's see, 16E uh, to align our, what is this called? Align our plan with council. Uh, with our prior recommendation on site selection. Okay. Perfect. The scripter, perhaps. To a well, th this is aligned with our previous recommendation on site selection, which is to encourage primarily affordable housing at Twenty Seven University. No, that wasn't what uh, Claire told us. What was the word? I'm not sure. Oh, you already you already entered it. You already entered it, Tim. When we weren't looking. Yeah. I okay. Just, great. Great. Help. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, I'll second that. And if there's not any other discussion, we can call a roll on that. It was me. Commissioner Heckman? No. Chair Lawing? Yes. Commissioner Regdal? Yes. Commissioner Rupervar? Yes. Commissioner Templeton? Uh, yes. Motion carries 4 to 1. Great, thank you. And now I just want to take great pleasure in thanking you. I'm sorry, maybe just before the great pleasure, can we just get the dissenting perspective if oh, you, sorry, sure. that's your typical procedure? Um, I, I actually explained during our discussion um, uh, my hesitancy to include that language. I don't have anything to add, but thank you for the opportunity. Okay, I will continue my pleasure of thanking the ad hoc uh, for their work on a very short time frame, a very lot of work, um, a lot of changes on up till now. Um, so I think it was uh, very effective for uh, Commissioner Templeton and Commissioner Rectal and in absentia tonight, uh, Commissioner Chang. So really appreciate on behalf of the whole commission um, that, that joint effort on really short notice and uh, you know great work ethic. Commissioner Templeton. I just want to echo your remarks and say it was a, a pleasure to work with the commissioners on the ad hoc. We were super collaborative and gave me a lot of optimism on, you know, continuing this work going forward. So thank you to Commissioner Rectal and Commissioner Chang. Great. I also would like to thank staff, Tim and uh, yeah, Jonathan would come that in. That was on next, their but I'll let you do oh, it. Go ahead. <laughs> would come in on their off Fridays and spend time with us. So I appreciate that. I thought it was collaborative and I thought it was productive. So thank you. Got director laid down in the weeds again, huh? Great. That's the staff team effort we're talking about. So, okay. We have some minutes to approve starting with uh, April 27. Draft summary minutes, packet page 64. And I'll recognize Commissioner Rectal. I'm sorry, Commissioner Heckman. I move approval of the April 27th draft summary minutes as revised. Second. No additions, okay. Go ahead and call roll. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Heckman. Yes. Chair Lawing? Yes. Commissioner Regdal? Yes. Commissioner Ruparvar? Yes. Commissioner Templeton? 
Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Great. And the next is our May 25th draft verbatim and summary meeting minutes. Move approval. Second. As revised. Second. Yep. Commissioner Hackman? Yes. Chair Lowing? Yes. Commissioner Regdal? Yes. Commissioner Ruperbar? Yes. Commissioner Templeton? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, just taking a quick look at um, our next meeting it's um, accessory dwelling units code changes. Um, Commissioner Templeton, you have a question? Yes. Um, so our our agenda says that that meeting is on the 7th, but our schedule says our next meeting is on the 13th. 13th. It's the 13th. The 13th. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And that stands. I don't know how long you think that's going to be, Director Light, but um, that's the only agenda item at this time. And then subsequent to that, we're having our uh, our recess. Um, I have some updates around my availability. Um, I There's a good chance I may be out on the 17th of July. And it's pretty definite I'm going to be out on the 10th of August. Um, got a family medical situation I have to be ready for that's scheduled for that date. So um, I may be gone those two dates. Did you say 7-13? Yes. Okay. And 8-10, thank you. And if something changes, I'll just show up on the 13th, but right now, currently, I may not be available. Okay. Commissioner Rupert. Are we still going to recess one of those days like we were planning a couple months ago? We're recessing on 727. Oh, I thought we were doing another one before or after. Am I mistaken? And that's why Commissioner Chang was asking about it. Like a couple meetings back. I mean, Commissioner Hackman, you remember, right? <laughs> no, we, but we never, I mean, we, we talked about it, but, but we only picked the I one. Mean, oh, I thought we were going to agree on a date later. If I'm mistaken, no worries. I thought that might just solve like. The I think the plan was for people to just update as the summer plans crystallize. Oh, okay. And then yeah. if we don't have a quorum, it becomes a recess. I see. I see. Okay. I don't think uh, we've heard from the ad hoc. So I don't think there are any other uh, committee reports. How about announcements of, of any kind? Um, it, this is not in our bailiwick, but it was so significant. I just want to bring it up uh, uh, inadvertently and included uh, Commissioner Commissioner uh, uh, Heckman. Uh, but I went to one of those concerts on Saturday night that we are now paying for again uh, and Rinkin out of park uh, sponsored by the city. And it was a Beatles cover band. It was just phenomenal. Um, and I don't mean just the music. I mean, I've got pictures of people, particularly as the thing went rolling on, thanks to John Lennon and Paul McCartney and the guys. Uh, I mean, they were up in the air like this and they were arm in arm at the end. I mean, you talk about community building and the community is back. I was just literally heartwarming for me to be part of that. So it was just wonderful. I you want to add to that? Yeah, only to, to say I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to if you didn't. And I believe that the uh, next one is on July 9th at... Um, at Rinconada, and Rinconada it's, uh, I, I, think, I think the band is called Petty Offense, maybe. It's a Tom Petty cover band, so, um, so come on out. I'm going to be there. Commissioner Templeton? Thank you. That reminds me of two things I want to share before we go. Um, one, uh, Omicron variant 4-5 is um, in town and immune <laughs> evasive, so if you do go out and enjoy all of our wonderful um, summer opportunities. Just be uh, conscious of your health and um, test if you, if you start to, to suspect and isolate if you find yourself positive. Uh, we had a lot of uh, 
graduation activities uh, in early June, and it was definitely going around uh, here in Palo Alto. So just to let you know. And the other is slightly more uh, topical for the PTC. Um, uh, earlier this month, Senator Becker had a town hall on homelessness that you can find on his sd13.senate.ca.gov uh, website under videos. It's really good. And uh, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. So I wanted to let you guys know about it in case you wanna watch it and see what's uh, going on in the world of addressing homelessness in the Bay Area. Thanks. Thanks for that ad. Uh, Commissioner Rubivar. Um, I just wanna echo Commissioner Templeton that you know the variant is here and it's very easily transmittable. We all caught it. Like, a whole damn Thanks. like extended family in Palo Alto with very minimal just outdoor contact. Um, it was insane. So just a warning to everybody, it's super easy to catch. On that positive note. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, actually, I just wanted on a, on a other not so positive note, but I wanted to just, uh, you know, acknowledge and be respectful of our colleague who lost her uh, father and she's not here tonight, um, still recovering. Um, but I thought just a, a slight, you know, note of that, we would just uh, adjourn the meeting uh, in honor of, of her dad. So very, very thoughtful. So with that, we stand adjourned. <laughs>